Hello, everyone. I'm Neil Drew, a health program specialist at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in the Office of Neural Exposome and Toxicology. Thank you for joining us today for this mini workshop on team science to advance neural exposome research. We had over 250 people registered for this webinar, so we're really thrilled that you are able to join us. We have a full agenda today, and I especially want to make sure we have enough time for discussion, so I won't delay things. I'll just mention a couple of housekeeping items first. We have set this up as a Zoom webinar. You won't be able to unmute. If you have a question during one of the presentations, we encourage you to enter it into the Q&A box. You can upvote questions there. We're monitoring the Q&A box and the chat, and we'll be able to direct your questions to the speakers and panelists. You can also activate captions under live transcript at the bottom of your screen. We are recording today's workshop and afterwards we'll make the recording viewable to everyone. I'll send all registrants a link once that's ready. Okay, with that, I'm pleased to move on to today's program. We'll first hear from Dr. Pamela Line, Department Chair and Professor of Molecular Biosciences at UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Her research focuses on mechanisms by which environmental stressors including persistent organic pollutants, organophosphorus cholinesterase inhibitors, and air pollutants influence neurodevelopmental seizure and neurode neurodegenerative disorders. She serves as director of the UC Davis Counteract Center of Excellence and co-editor-in-chief of the Elsevier Journal Neurotoxic. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, I think there should be another slide coming up here. Great, thank you. So it's my extreme pleasure to kick off today's mini workshop, which is part of a larger initiative launched by the NINDS um, to really determine how to move forward with integrating neural exposome research into the IND NINDS uh, mission space. And so um, I will give a, a quick review of the NANS Council, uh, which is basically meeting uh, be over a year to uh, do some fact finding on what do we know about the neural exposome, what are significant research gaps in this field in the context of the NINDS mission space. And at the end of this, we're hoping to put together a report to the NINDS with recommendations on um, research priorities, research gaps in the space of the neural exposome as it pertains to the NNDS uh, mission state. So what you see in this slide here is the strategic planning uh, schedule, if you will. And so we have a number of goals for the strategic plan development. The first is that we really want to define exposome research within the NINDS mission, as I previously alluded to. And the goal of the working committee is to identify and prioritize, prioritize areas of neural exposome research. We're also hoping to identify best practices for communicating with and engaging uh, neuroscientists in exposome research, which is a new area for many people in neuroscience. And so one of the goals is to determine how do we encourage people who don't have expertise in the exposome to start engaging in this type of research. And then also we would like to identify best practices for fostering more collaboration between NNDS and other NIHICs, and I would say perhaps other funding agencies that per, um, have expertise that pertains to exposome research, for example, NSF. Um, we also are hoping to identify tools and resources that advance neural exposome research. And I suppose one thing I should have said at the beginning, but I think Dave is going to talk about this more, David Jett, is um, there is a great deal of interest in uh, really moving NINDS into the area of exposome research because of the fact that I think we're all aware now that uh, we really, in order to make a lot of progress in a number of neurological disorders, need to understand the entire environment and how it's interacting with disease processes and with resiliency to determine outcome at the level of the individual. And so that is the, the goal of looking at this field of exposome research in the context of neurological diseases. So there are two strategic planning workshops. Um, uh, I am chairing the working group um, of council to identify research priorities, and there's a number of experts uh, across different sectors in our, uh, NINDS mission space that have been brought together to address this issue. And then following our report to the NINDS, there will be an internal NINDS strategic plan development committee that will develop the implementation plan. 
And so as part of our fact-finding mission, we have worked with the NINDS staff to organize two neural exposome mini workshops. This is the first of those two, which is to really focus on team science to advance neural exposome research. The exposome, uh, by definition, involves uh, many diverse sorts of data streams being integrated to inform effects at the level of the whole organism. And so by its very nature, it's very interdisciplinary. And so it's going to require team science in order to really integrate the exposome research field into classic um, neuroscience research. And so that is really the goal of today's workshop is to determine what are best practices in team science are there any unique aspects of the exposome research involving team science that the working uh, group of council should be aware of as we start to form our recommendations to the NINDS? There will be a second mini workshop, which will be focused on tools and resources that are available for exposome research and importantly, identifying gaps in the tools and resources that would be needed to really advance research in the neural exposome. Um, so you can see that is scheduled for April 19th, and we hope many of you will be able to join us for that as well. But again, the goal of these mini workshops is to really provide information to the working group of council uh, to help us form our research priorities in the report that we'll be providing to the NINDS. The timeline for these activities are shown on the right of the slide. So we had our strategic planning kickoff in 2023. Um, and then uh, through 2024, we've had a number of meetings of the working group, um, which has been divided into uh, three subcommittees. And then we all meet back together to share the outcomes of the subcommittee research. And we have the two virtual mini workshops. So we're hoping to basically have an open meeting to discuss the uh, research priority draft that the working group puts together sometime in mid-July. So we can invite public feedback on that and then to finalize our report to council in September of 2024. And then the goal of NANDS is to have an implement, implementation plan to the council by February of 2025. So hopefully um, we'll have lots of great input today to inform our decision-making and um, encourage all of you that are engaged in today's workshop to reach out to any of the members of the working committee and that's published on the NANDS workshop with any recommendations you might have following today's mini workshop. And with that, I will um, turn it back over to Neil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Line. Um, I don't see any questions, so. I'd, I'd now like to introduce Dr. David A. Jett, Director of the Office of Neural Exposome and Toxicology at NINDS. Dr. Jett's scientific interest is in the impact of chemical agents on nervous system function, including the molecular and cellular mechanisms of cognitive and neural development. Dr. Jett has served on White House and intergovernmental committees that set the nation's research priorities, as well as science advisory panels for the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Defense. Dr. Jett. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I just wanted to say there's a typo up there. November 24th should be 23rd, obviously. Um, so, yeah. So, oh, first of all, he hello, everyone. And um, I am the director of this office. Um, I've been here for a while. For that, I was um, faculty at Johns Hopkins and the neurotoxicologist. And this will be a short presentation on what we're doing in exposome research at NINDS and why team science is so, so important. That's just a big claimer thing. Um, so, as you know, our focus is on the brain and the nervous system, and um, we're more, I guess, uh, of a disease-driven institute, maybe, but we also have a very strong basic research component to figure out the causes of these diseases. So, first, is what is the exposome? And I always tell people it's not the exosome. That's different. Um, I like to say that this is really the next step after the Human Genome Project. And what we'll get out of this work will be the integration of genetics and exposomics. Uh, so we know that genetics are, uh, well, we know that 
that there that it uh, provides insight to the etiologies of inherited diseases, but actually most uh, health risks cannot be explained by genetics alone. And some people say maybe six to sixteen percent can be explained by genetics alone. So there's you know eight hundred eight eighty more uh, things that we haven't uh, looked into. So back, so Dr. Wild coined the word exosome back in 2005, and it was really just on environmental exposures. Now it's really on all inheritable factors that affect gene expression, and it's across the lifespan. So I think this is a new frontier um, of, bio, of really of all biomedical research um, that will, I think, complement what we've learned with the genome. And I think at the end, we're gonna see that it's gonna unlo unlock more holistic approaches to disease prevention, as well as better interventions. So um, there has, I think, been an explosion of papers on the exposome since that 2005 paper and a ton of exposome figures but they all really are about this, this, the same thing, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you go in and look and, and you'll see just many, many, um, many, many, many of these figures on the exposome. So yeah, I always put this, and actually um, a lot of the exposome talks are now using this movie advertisement and, and in its broadest sense, you can make the argument that the exposome is really everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, now, when we think of the neurological disorders, we know most have complex etiologies that include, that include these non-inheritable factors, and we're, we're calling them the neural exposome. Um, so as this effort was growing, we put together a paper of um, one, of, one of our major journals to describe our initial thinking for the office. Um, it includes our own view of what the neural exposome looks like. And I'm happy to say others are now using this picture in other papers coming out. And what you see here are three of these little areas that we, we are calling the exposome. One is uh, exogenous factors, such as, of course, environmental toxicants, but also things like noise and climate change. Um, and then in, endogenous factors, which you put genes and epigenetics in there, but also things like the microbiome and xenobiotics. And then taking it just to its own uh, ball, I guess, are the behavioral factors, which Yes, includes the psychosocial effects, but again, also things like lifestyle, sleep, um, and stress. So now a true exosomic research project would include, for example, sleep and air pollution and micro, uh, microbiome. So you can see that this kind of work demands team science and the need for these three areas to be, you know, have the scientific expertise. So here, so we had an early focused area that will require team science. Um, I say early because as you know, we have a group of experts working on a strategic plan that will help us decide what our priorities will look like. Um, but sort of as we've already seen, exogenous factors, chemical exposures, climate change, and we're doing a lot and working with our other office in, in health disparities. Um, and then uh, gene environment interactions, microbiome, metabolome, and then behavioral factors. We've already done some work in the psychosocial field. Um, so that's basically so far what we're doing. Now, so these are just, I think, some of the reasons the exosome is timely. Um, there are opportunities that now have become more available, uh, things like the data, human studies, biobanks, um, wearables, biomarkers, uh, tools 
and, and by the way, this picture that you see of the, um, I guess it's a ladybug, with those little things in front of it are these things that you can let free in the air and they will fall down to the ground and you can actually look at air pollution with those. So, I mean, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on. I'm um, in the middle, um, the, the top is the, the Exposome Bootcamp at Columbia and those other tools like databases like CTD, um, the HERE program here at NIEHS and other things. And then type team science, which is absolutely critical. And um, a lot of it's gonna depend on all of us and you to really think about how to uh, do more true team science, because without it, the exposome, in my opinion, isn't gonna work. Uh, okay, this is my sneaky reminder of part two of this. It will be in April and it's on the tools and resources that science needs for uh, work on the neuroexposome, such as this, um, the wearables that you see here. It's just mind boggling how many different kinds of wearables there are now. Okay, so let's skip to a few examples. Uh, many, of, many of the diseases you think about in our NINDS mission space are already being studied within the exposome. Um, here with uh, Alzheimer's disease related dementias, you see exogenous and endogenous factors um, and its interaction with genetics, but also the, the see, you see the importance of time. Uh, for example, here, uh, the exosome really starts in prenatal life and follows through early adolescence and adult, adult life. And the epigenetics effects actually happen very early on. Here's just a slide um, uh, for Parkinson's disease with a, an agenda that includes the environmental factors in both preclinical and clinical aspects where they are both important. So even things like spinal cord injury, in, th in this case, a simple environmental enrichment cage in rats increased uh, regeneration of the dorsal rat, uh, a route ganglion and neurite outgrowth after um, transaction, nerve transaction. So with this, I mean, think about what that could do in human studies and in human interaction uh, um, treatment. So here is just, a, it's, a, it's, it's a review where they show many exosome factors um, of cardiovascular disease and things like air pollution, uh, child uh, malnutrition, malnutrition and climate. The important part is think of what this data can do for future health research as well as preventative medicine. And you can see all of the different, different uh, things that they looked at. Okay, I don't wanna, just a couple more of these. Uh, so this is one on multifactorial analysis and basically 348 environmental variables from, this was from the ABC study, uh, were chosen for represent, represent, representing the multiple dimensions of the exosome. And um, basically they were reduced using uh, this iterative process of exploratory factor analysis and ended up with only six factors. Uh, six of these fact, uh, factors. And this is one on image neuroimaging. Um, the bottom line was they sh showed that brain imaging phenotypes are determined by genetic variations, but also environmental exposures, gene gene interactions, environmental environmental interactions, and gene environmental interactions. And the, the brain imaging phenotypes will result in individual differences in cognitive ability and other things. Okay, so for team, so, for, so I put this random uh, uh, football uh, group together <laughs> just to show um, how important uh, teams are. I mean, 
you need a quarterback and a runner and a kicker and a defender and et cetera. And I think that really one of the major parts of why my office is timely, I believe, are the different workshops in the past five or so years that focused on environmental research as it relates to disease. And workshops included mental health, aging, one we did on brain health and disease. And the thing that they all had in common was the need for more research and more importantly, more uh, team science, collaboration in team science. And so also the NIEHS led a comprehensive series of workshops that helped, at least helped me and others understand what we're up against in fully understanding the exposome. Another thing we did very early on in this office was um, we, we fostered a more collaborative um, across the uh, more collaboration across the NIHIC in, uh, institutes and centers. And we put together an NIH wide environmental working group to talk about everything from ideas from collaboration, and new programs to requests for information um, from the public ideas for SOT and SFN symposiums and bringing in speakers on the exposome for our group to um, look at. Um, and this is the our uh, request for information that we did a couple, uh, a while back actually. And thanks to Claudia and Neil Sondar for that. Basically the two topics uh, were collaboration and team science and then tools and resources. And this is the workshop on team science. And, uh, and as I said before, we'll have the other one um, in a, I think April. And we received a lot on specific top topics, but what I want you to see is what has been on my mind at least for the most, and that is engaging more neuroscientists. You know, with thousands of, of them, only a few are engaged in exosome research. So last but least, uh, me, we started um, early. I didn't want to wait uh, too long. So we started the science with several funding opportunities, both on our own and some with other institutes. These included so far um, things like environmental toxicants, um, work with the ECHO program. We did some work with climate change. We did bike biocycle social factors, in this case with uh, social isolation. Um, and connectedness. Uh, let's see, environmental stress and, and environmental stress in the health inequities of Alzheimer's disease to, to really look at what we're looking at for uh, health inequities. Other things like the microbiome, uh, pain research, um, some other kinds of exosome studies in Alzheimer's disease, and also a, a center for exosome research. And I'll say now that. Um, there's two more that will be out soon, uh, one on the exosome and Lewy body disease and one on uh, nervous system exposures. And they'll be out soon. Okay, so that's it. And thanks to our office, we have um, three branches and we focused on the exosome branch. I have a fantastic small group that runs the office. Um, but you can imagine, and it's not surprising, that for exosome, we work with all of the people at NINDS and many other ICs as well, um, and, he, and other agencies as well. So that's it for me, and thank you for listening. And I don't know if there's questions time, but um, thank you. I don't, I don't see any questions, so uh, we'll, we'll move ahead with the agenda. Thank you, Dr. Jett. We next have a team presentation for today's mini workshop on team science. This one is from Dr. Karen David and Mr. Corey Kelly, both from NINDS.
Dr. Karen David is a program director with the goal of promoting uh, team science, enhancing species diversity in neuroscience, fundamental neuroscience, and the integration of multi-scale approaches to solve complex systems neuroscience questions. She led the creation of the new team science funding opportunity, the NINDS Collaborative Opportunities for Multidisciplinary, Bold, and Innovative Neuroscience Program, the, com the combined program, which she currently co-leads with Corey Kelly. This combined program as part of the NINDS Strategic Plan for Research is designed to support interdisciplinary research teams to achieve transformative goals that could not be met by individual or parallel efforts. In addition to co-leading the combined program, Mr. Corey Kelly serves as the advisor for research operations and program implementation in the research operations branch within the NINDS Division of Extramural Activities. Their talk is, is titled, Collaborative Opportunities for Multidisciplinary, Bold, and Innovative Neuroscience. Thank you, Neil. All right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Corey Kelly. As Neil said, I'm a program officer here at NINDS, where my work focuses on team science, research operations, and program implementation. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the NINS One Talks team for holding this critical workshop, as, as well as my fellow speakers, and most importantly, the Neuro Exposome community for your interest in time. Today, along with my excellent program co-lead, Karen David, we're going to be discussing the NINS flagship team science program, the Combine program. First, I'll provide some background on the landscape and best practices of team science, and then Karen will discuss how we've integrated this knowledge into our Combine program theory and implementation. I must also thank our exceptional Combine NINS scientific review officers, Boshan Chen and Li Jaya, as well as the study section members, and all of our amazing NINS staff that helped make this very complex program happen. My talk today will primarily be about team science, but the Combine program specifically was created to utilize the power of team science to achieve the most ambitious goals in neuroscience, to achieve transformative science, a paradigm shift, a revolution in our understanding of the brain. I often find myself going back to Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, commonly known as structure. Kuhn wrote, during revolutions, scientists see new and different things when looking with familiar instruments in places they've looked before. It is rather as if the professional community has been suddenly transported to another planet where familiar objects are seen in a different light or are joined by unfamiliar ones as well. There's been a great many paradigm shifts in neuroscience throughout the course of history where our concept of normal science completely changes. I myself was first drawn to neuroscience through the classical discourse on the duality of the brain and the mind. Aristotle, Plato, Descartes, Aquinas, Locke, and my how far neuro normal science has come since the era of antiquity. Luigi Galvani's discovery of electrical excitability of neurons, Camille Golgi's staining methodology, Paul Broca's theory of the brain and structure, Bernard Katz's modeling of the synapse, and Marion Diamond's work on neuroplasticity that serves as the foundation of modern, modern neuroscience, and many more. Yet despite all of these great works of which we stand on the shoulders, neuroscience in the brain still remains the great final frontier of biomedical science. And the Combine program was established for those investigators willing to take the risk of eschewing neural science, pushing the boundaries of our understanding and achieving this transformation, this paradigm shift, this revolution, this fundamental change in how we understand the brain. However, the most ambitious goals and challenges of modern neuroscience research are increasingly dependent on collaborative approaches that leverage not only diverse disciplines, expertise, and perspectives, but effective interactions between team members. Team science is still a burgeoning field. The roots of team science began in the 1990s here at NIH, and as NCI begins to seek transdisciplinary approaches to understanding the myriad of factors that contribute to cancer pathology, treatment, and care. We're quite honored today to have one of those NC pioneers of team science, Michelle Bennett, as a speaker. Dr. Bennett's collaboration and team science field guide was first published in 2010. It's considered by myself and many in the team science field to be the foundational work uh, that established our field. Over the course of the last decade, there have been a proliferation of work in team science, but the field is still just beginning to transition from shared practices to evidence-informed and evidence-based practices, the science of team science. As we build team science programs, and team science research projects, we can look towards this pioneering work for lessons learned. We found that facilitators of team science include beneficial attitudes and beliefs, effective team processes, brokering and bridge building activities, and funding initiative characteristics, while barriers include integration, discipline-based differences, and project management, and the incentive and reward system. 
Moreover, a critical component of team science is inclusion of diverse perspectives. A fundamental tenet of team science is the concept that despite our best intentions, everyone will always have residual bias. But by bringing together diverse per perspectives, the impact of our residual biases can be mitigated, and ultimately our findings can be more generalizable. But bringing together diverse perspectives requires not only per which perspectives require, but also how to manage conflict and create common ground, which I'll talk about in a later slide. Last, I would like to highlight community-based participatory research, a powerful team science-based methodology for building sustainable interventions. CBPR goes beyond patient advocacy or patient outcomes, but integrates the community members as a collaborator from the very start of the research. The researchers work alongside the community to identify the problems, develop the information, in in interventions, and sustain change. So how do we build effective team science programs? First, we start with purposeful program theory. This means the alignment between the problem statement, the research questions, the conceptual framework, the methodologies, and the outcomes. Simply, alignment allows for a stronger argument of program causality, that the program is indeed the driving factor of change. I'll give a caveat, this is my favorite slide, and, and anybody that knows me knows I could spend an hour on this slide alone, but I won't do that to you today. Um, I want to present a program theory tool um, that is very powerful. It's called a logic model. I encourage everyone to take a look at these when you're developing programs or research projects. Um, this is how you can establish causality. This is how you can demonstrate progress. Um, working backwards from the ultimate long-term goals, we can create a chain of logic from the long-term to the short-term. We can then determine the specific activities and participants requisite to achieve these outcomes and the requisite resources to perform these activities. Each of these elements also considers the assumptions and external factors that are necessary for success. Last, and perhaps most importantly, a logic model has key performance indicators for each factor, which allows for a very granular assessment of what's working and not working towards achieving the outcomes. One of the fundamental concepts of team science implementation is Bruce Tuckman's uh, stages of team science development. Uh, first is forming when the team comes together, then is storming, which is where you're really trying to figure out how your team dynamic is. Then is norming, which is once you've kind of established the norms and the boundaries and the parameters of your, your collaboration, and then performing, which where you're in the groove and you're starting to produce research products. And lastly, a journey. Um, and this is that every team should be intentional, come together with a purpose and adjourn when the task is complete. So now that we've discussed the funded foundational concepts and structure of team science programs, what are the best practices for team science implementation? The first practice is clear, organized, organizational structure, team composition, and roles. We say that the organization and the structure enables the people and the roles to utilize the platforms and processes to produce meaningful products. In the same light is shared vision, shared contributions, and shared decision making. Teams should come together for a specific purpose, and requisite compos composition of the team should be evidence based. It should be intentional. Particularly for the Combine program, we very much want trainees to be involved not only in the conduct of the neuroscience, but the team science so that the future workforce is better enabled as most multidisciplinary leaders. Last, conflict is normal and often inevitable. Having conflict resolution plans in place prospectively is far more effective than trying to figure out what to do in the heat of the moment. An excellent way to support all of these practices is to generate a collaboration agreement upon team formation. I provided an example um, from the Many Babies Project, which is a large team science or a big team science project. Data management and sharing is already a complex and sometimes a laborious task that is further complicated in large co collaborations. First and foremost, consider how you may need to harmonize outcome data from the various disciplines contributing to the project. Second, work early to identify cross-institutional barriers and have the requisite agreements in place. Third, consider how you must, may best disseminate these data to facilitate up uptake and translation. Of course, as of 2023, the NIH has additional requirements for data management sharing. We have an excellent NINS staff group in this space, and I encourage any everyone to um, visit our NINS website where you can gain inf more information and, and potential repositories specific to neuroscience. Um, you can just Google NINS data sharing, and it, will, it should come up as a result. Last and most importantly, plan prospectively. The worst thing that can happen is you reach the end of a five-year award and you realize that you can't harmonize your data in a meaningful way. Once the team is established and work begins, agile resource sharing is critical in the dynamic environment of team science, particularly for complex projects. The journey to the goal, the approaches, the expertise, it changes. 
Again, I encourage the use of logic model and the key performance indicators to inform where resources can best be utilized. Moreover, to achieve this level of agility, it's critical to have frequent communications with all members of the team to understand progress, barriers, and next steps. There are many platforms to support effective team interactions, uh, such as the Gantt chart that visualizes long-term activities and interdependencies, which is something we strongly recommend to our combine applicants, as well as the Kanban board, um, which is a tool that can facilitate acute task management between the teams. This is something Karen and I use every day to run this program. Coordination, communication, knowledge transfers are cornerstones of any scientific endeavor. But this is particularly uh, relevant in team science and even more relevant in this era of big data and multi-omics. Um, first, it's critical to avoid cross-disciplinary crosstalk. This occurs when there's a false assumption between uh, of a shared understanding between um, members uh, between team members with of different disciplines. Next, create a dialogical environment, a culture of interactions that's founded on conversations between team members, rather than the traditional dictation between a team leader and a team member. In the same vein, conduct brokering activities, activities that are specifically meant to facilitate conversations and transfer of knowledge, as opposed to activities that are simply for the implementation of the project. Last, cross-disciplinary research provides additional avenues for dissemination, including the field of team science, which very much seeks to learn from the lived experience of all fields. Some of these outlets include the International Network for the Science of Team Science, the Association of Clinical and Translational Research, and the Big Team Science Organization. As teams begin to generate scientific products, credit assignment is often a source of acute uh, conflict in scientific teams, especially in the era uh, of, of collaboration. It is essential to adapt and utilize a credit assignment taxonomy that prospectively defines the roles and the effort to warrant credit on scientific products. Another of the pressing topics in team science right now is the recognition of team science and performance and promotion. R01s and forced author papers aren't necessarily the measure, primary measure of success in team science, and we need to begin to weigh the merit of team science alongside these traditional measures. This is really a call to action to all scientists and all administrators, whether leading a lab, a department, or an institution, to think about how we can recognize and celebrate these collaborative successes just as much as individual performance. In summary, how do we develop and come to team science to achieve meaningful change? We start with purposeful program theory to establish probable causality. We then rely on implementation dissemination to ensure fidelity of the program and uptake of the findings along the translational spectrum. And we use team science to glue this all together, ensuring that we both have the right team to achieve the goal and that this team can work together effectively. Thank you. And you can reach both Karen and I at um, NINS Team Science at NIH.gov. Great. Thank you, Corey. Share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen David. I'm a program director at NINDS and the NIH Brain Initiative. And following Corey's talk on considerations regarding team science, it's my pleasure to describe to you our new team science program at NINDS and how this program came about. So my colleague Jim Nutt and I led our NINDS team to create this program. And the resulting team science program called the Combined Program is currently led and managed by myself together with Corey Kelly. So first I'll talk about why are we supportive of team science? Then I'll walk you through the thought process behind designing our new team science for program for NINDS. And I'll be highlighting its features. In this way, I can note to you the elements that we considered to be important for collaborations to increase the likelihood of success. And this can also inform us how we can go about in combining or integrating disciplines to advance neural exposome research. So we're also excited to have with us today our panel of speakers whom we draw inspiration from regarding our team science practice and I'll point out in my talk which aspect of our thinking is related and informed by findings from our speakers today. So first, why team science? We very much identify with this quote from the NIH Brain Initiative 2025 report highlighting the importance of collaborations. So no single researcher or discovery will solve the brain's complex mysteries and the most exciting approaches will be interdisciplinary, bridging and combining distinct expertise and disciplines. So a team science approach affords us the opportunity to extend beyond the limitations of a single lab effort, and it enables us to tackle neuroscience problems in a more comprehensive, 
rigorous and mechanistic manner. And so given the importance of team science, we set out to create a new team science program for NINDS. So first we started by asking, how do we optimize how NINDS supports team science? And to answer this, our strategic team research mechanism working group compared and contrasted how other institutes, programs, and funding agencies support team science so that we can learn about the best practices and challenges associated with team-based approaches. We were also driven by the goals outlined in the NINDS strategic plan for research, which recognizes the importance of supporting team science of broad scope and complexity. And we would also like to further mobilize the scientific community to collaborate, to leverage their diverse expertise, and to take advantage of the increasing knowledge base and technological capabilities in various fields. And so we set out to design a new team science funding opportunity for NINDS, and our approach was to take the best features of other team science funding opportunities and discard what we don't want. And also to learn from our collective experience with various team science programs regarding the challenges and opportunities associated with team-based approaches. And so we built this new combined program using our lessons learned from other funding mechanisms. For example, some of the projects we've supported did not achieve the extent of integration that we envisioned. Some are a collection of projects or parallel efforts rather than an integrated effort across the PIs. And some seem to be large R01s driven by a single PI with sidekicks. So towards this, inspired by the NIGMS RM1, our combined program emphasizes interdisciplinary collaborations from three to six PIs who will work together, converge their expertise to solve a defined problem. And also we've noticed that some team-based efforts suffer from poor team management, which neg negatively affects the science. So we consider having a well thought out team management plan to be very important. And I'll talk more about this in the next slides. We also would like to set these teams up for success by providing the resources and infrastructure needed for managing and coordinating these efforts. And lastly, team science efforts are a great opportunity for us to promote diverse perspectives in the teams. And so we are borrowing from the NIH Brain Initiative this required attachment of a plan for enhancing diverse perspectives. And another observation about team science that stood out to be particularly important for us is that the team science structure informs function, as well as the extent of integration across the efforts of the PIs. So what do I mean by this? To illustrate, I'll be going through an overview of the differences across the current ways that NINDS supports team science. So the blue circle here is meant to symbolize a single project or component. And so for the PO1 program project, we depict its multi-component structure where you have some number of projects plus course, and these components will have interrelated and parallel goals. And the consequence of this structure is that it promotes parallel distributed and interrelated efforts across the PIs rather than a full, fully combined team effort. And there's another way to get collaborations funded at NINDS, and that's through a mechanism that most of us are familiar with, and this is the parent R01. And in contrast to the PO1, this will be a single project with multiple specific aims. So this R01 can come from a single lab or a collaboration from a multiple set of PIs. And what we've noticed that although the R01 is a single project, we still could not get the extent of integration that we wanted because the PIs have to structure their project into multiple specific aims. And this is because the usual assumption is that specific aims need to be independent rather than interdependent. And so for the RM1 combined program, our goal is to achieve a degree of integration currently not possible with these other mechanisms, such as the PO1 and RO1. 
And the way we were able to achieve this is we asked for a single focus goal that by design would require the merging or combining of disciplines to be achieved. And also we freed up the PIs from the constraints of a specific aim. And this is the resulting product. So here we summarize the features of our new combined program. So we consider team science to be powerful. And so we expect that the goal proposed is bold, impactful, and challenging and achievable within the funding duration of five years. We also emphasize that teams work towards a single focus goal and not propose a collection of independent uh, pieces or aims. So we want a goal that can only be achieved by the combined efforts of three to six multiple principal investigators, each with a distinct and essential expertise, as well as adequate bandwidth and equivalent efforts. We also expect that projects are of a larger scope and of more complexity than you, what you would typically see in a parent R1. And because team science is a social activity, we're also looking for thoughtful plans for team management, leadership, and coordination, and for plans for enhancing diverse perspectives. And also the structure of the application reflects our priorities. So first and foremost is the science. And we recommend to applicants to make sure to describe how their work is transformative, integrated, and innovative. And the application also requires three other attachments based on the considerations that we find are important in increasing the likelihood of success. So first, we ask for a thoughtful plan on how the team will be managed and led. And second, we ask for a timeline and benchmarks for success. And this will be the team's roadmap to success. And third, we ask for plans on how to capitalize on and enhance diverse perspectives um, through this project. So I'll be going through what these attachments entail because these are important team science considerations regardless of the funding mechanism. So team science needs effective leadership, management, and coordination to be successful. And although team science promotes cross-fertilization across disciplines, the actual practice of bringing people from different backgrounds together to converge their expertise, this brings several challenges, especially in disciplines with their own specialized language. So we recommend to applicants that they consult this document that NCI put together with practical suggestions, such as, for example, having a collaborative agreement template that you can find in the appendix. And we're very pleased to have with us today, Dr. Bennett, who co-authored this field guide. And I'll just point out here other important considerations when building a team, regardless of the funding opportunity. And Corey talked about some of these points. And this list is informed by the NIGMS RM1, the NCI field guide, and from our experience with our funded teams. And we look forward to hearing from Dr. Clairbeau about some of these team coordination elements and resources that facilitated her large team collaboration. So in this document, here is where the applicants can ask for the support that they need in running the team. So for example, this is where they can include justification for a program coordinator or manager, as well as other needs that may arise. For example, Corey Kelly talked about data management. And so this is where you can ask for resources for data management across labs. Uh, you can ask for a professional staff if needed to help make that multimodal or multi-scale data talk to each other or have it be accessible across labs and by the greater community. And there's also the challenge here of credit assignment and authorship policies, especially with team effort. And so we look forward to hearing from Dr. Baumgartner about her experience and useful tools to nav navigate this challenging issue, especially that our trainees and early career stage personnel have to navigate the individual focus nature of incentives in science. And also we've asked applicants to consider the practicalities and logistics in coordinating and communicating across the different team members. So overall, these are important points to be thinking about when planning a collaboration, regardless of the funding opportunity. Okay, so the next other attachment we asked for is the timeline and benchmarks for success. And this is for reviewers to assess the feasibility as well as the degree of integration and collaboration. 
So this serves as the roadmap to success for the team. And it includes a timeline and chart noting the tasks and benchmarks, as well as points of integration. So for collaborations, it's really clear that the team members are, are very much aligned with what they consider to be benchmarks for success collectively, as well as for their individual contributions. And the third attachment that we asked for is the plan for enhancing diverse perspectives. And this was pioneered by the Brain Initiative. And the motivation for this is to capitalize on what diverse perspectives have to offer. So PEDP is a summary of strategies and activities by the team to advance the merit of the science through enhancing inclusivity. And our definition of diverse perspectives is broad, and this includes diverse perspectives from those doing the research, for example, those who are underrepresented from different scientific disciplines, career stage, backgrounds, and so on. Could also come from those participating in the research, for example, who's being recruited in your, in your human neuroscience studies, or where are the specimens coming from, how is it obtained, and so on and also where the research is being done. And this could be reflected in the different types of institutions. So we're very excited to share that we've awarded our first set of combined projects and the diverse topics covered include basic research, translational research and various disease topics. All of these integrate different disciplines. And I rec recommend checking out this list using this QR code. And we're grateful to have one of our RM1 combined teams join us today to talk about their combined project. So thank you, Dr. Jay Lee. And one other project I'd like to highlight is this one that released a nice summary of what it's about. And here's the link to the article. So here we have six teams bringing together scientists in pediatrics, genetics, bioinformatics, and psychiatry to understand how and why cells die in two lysosomal storage disorders that affect the brain. So the central hypothesis that's gluing them together is that they hypothesize that it's the changes in the communication between the lysosome and the rest of the cell, rather than the storage related issues itself that is driving the disease pathogenesis. So thanks again for having us and hopefully we're able to tell you about what we consider to be important in collaborations, as well as describe to you the, the potential challenges to anticipate regarding team science. So that's it from us, thanks again. Okay, thank you very much, Karen and Corey. Um, we have time for a question. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone, uh, any of the panelists have a question while we wait. Uh, I'll ask one that came in through the chat and that is, Karen, can you I, uh, elaborate or expand a little bit on what you mean by uh, data management? Great, um, thank you. And Corey Kelly will chime in too. Um, so the data management that we talked about that also drawing from our experience from our brain initiative teams is where you have, for example, very diverse data set that needs to com be combined together or shared across labs. And that kind of infrastructure need to be built and it's not available anywhere else because it's also peculiar to the type of data set that you're trying to integrate. So we're, we allow for those kind of resources to be asked for in the combined, um, combined funding opportunity because these are something that needs to be worked out from the ground up and hopefully how these data sets are integrated could be informative to other um, other types of uh, science that will need to integrate these um, diverse data sets. Corey? Yeah, thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you for the question. Um, perhaps I can give an example um, from my extramural career. Um, I worked in neurological surgery research. Um, we, what we did was we used intravascular ultrasound measurements of blood flow 
and combine those with computational models and genetic models. And so what we had to figure out was how do we harmonize these data so that the engineers are utilizing our images correctly so that their models are you know, set up with the correct parameters? And how can the, the geneticists and the biologists match their in vitro experiments um, with 3D modeling of blood vessels in, um, to align all that data together? And so if we first had to think about how are we going to bring this data together uh, you know, and integrate it and harmonize it. And then the other aspect of that is we had to figure out simply just how are we going to share this data among labs that are in different locations in different, um, you know, fields. And ultimately we decided our solution was to purchase our own network attached server where we completely had complete control and fluidity of the data between the labs. That's great. Amazing, <laughs> amazing solution. Uh, Pam, you have a question? If you address this, and I missed this, but did you um, set up special emphasis panels to review these combined grants? Because I think one of the one of the questions or issues that the working group is is kind of grappling with is obviously going to team science. Um, the traditional study sections aren't necessarily trained in how to evaluate that kind of science. So any comments you have on that would be much appreciated. Right, and I can't emphasize it enough that the need for a special emphasis panel because this is a unique program with a different set of priorities. And we're also trying to go against, um, for example, what's typically ex uh, accepted or um, how do you regard an parent R1, for example. So we want reviewers to stop thinking about that and could, because this is not business as usual. So we do have a special emphasis panel and we do reviewer orientations. Um, before the review, as well as a reminder of what priorities are on the actual review. And this also, what works for us is our strong partnership between program, as well as our wonderful SRO, because these are very, the, basically the review is a key essential piece that determine the success of the program. So this very collaborative um, relationship that we have has been really beneficial for us. Corey? Thank you, Karen. Of course, I echo our thanks to our, our SROs and our study section. I think the only other thing I would add is we were very particular in the composition of the study section to make sure that we balanced which was quite a burden, but diverse scientific disciplines on e every single application, um, as well as um, scientists who had experience in, in, in large transformative collaborations and could provide more of that team science perspective as well. Thank you. This is very helpful. And I do see that Beata Ritz um, has a follow-up question to mine, which is, are these across in institutions with subcontracts, et cetera? I, I can answer, Karen. Go ahead. Sure, thank you. Um, so for our program, there's a couple questions in there. Different institutions, yes or no, and sub awards, yes or no. Um, so for our program, we have no preference for if teams are in the same institution, same department, different institutions, different fields. We ultimately want the scientific goal to drive the team composition. And so we want the best people to achieve that goal no matter where they are. Um, and so the second part, we require three, a minimum three to six PIs. Um, so we do have a contact PI for the administrative purposes, but the PIs, as Karen mentioned, are supposed to have an equitable and equal dis distribution of, of decision making. Um, so one would be the contact PI and the others would be several words to the other PIs or co-Is or whatnot. Yep. Okay. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, there may be more questions that come into the chat, but we'll answer them um, kind of asynchronously. Uh, at this point, we're going to take a short break and give us all a chance to stretch our legs. Um, we'll meet back here in five minutes, uh, which I have as 2.05 Eastern. OK. Um, we're ready to get started. Welcome back. Our next speaker is Dr. Lore Alex Clairbeau. She is a senior researcher in the Institute of Experimental and Clinical Research at the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clairbeau's work is driven by an inter interdisciplinary approach based on synergistic collaborations and translational research. 
During the pandemic, Dr. Clairbeau worked at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission as the main coordinator of an interdisciplinary project involving more than 70 scientists worldwide, aiming at organizing the plethora of experimental and clinical data on COVID-19. Her talk today is titled, An Affair to Remember, How Adverse Outcome Pathways Catalyzed Interdisciplinary Collaboration. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity indeed to present an affair that we believe is worth to remember how these AOPs catalyze interdisciplinary collaboration during pandemic time. Um, so my only disclaimer is that the work I will present is really uh, the work of a team that I have just the pleasure to be the one uh, presenting today. So let's start maybe with uh, what is an adverse outcome pathway and with this uh, paradigm shift in the chemical risk assessment, which aims to move from uh, observation of adverse endpoint in a whole organism uh, towards really a comprehensive understanding of the mechanism. And this was already uh, proposed in the toxicity testing in the 21st century a vision and strategy back in 2007, but also at the European level, how to address the new challenges for risk assessments. And that's why there have been different uh, peer review publication or reflection group that propose first the mode of action framework, but also the adverse outcome pathway. So adverse outcome pathway or AOP, that's the acronym, it's really a way, a framework to represent uh, somehow the domino effect. So we have an initiating event that leads to something next, something next, something next, up to something bad. And if we look in, into what happened into a body, when a body is exposed to a chemical, it will start with a, a initiating event, the connection between the stressor of the chemical with the body uh, at the molecular level that it leads to a cellular response tissue response that will induce an organ response up to an organ system response or tissue response, an organism and up to uh, adverse outcome at the population level. A metaphor that we use to propose to really understand what is an AOP, it doesn't really aim to depict all the pathway and all the possible way of pathological pathway leading to an adverse outcome, but it's one way to go from A to B, like for this uh, Google map example. So AOPs, are really collaborative tool because they help to synthesize the current knowledge that are produced from different sources because it's cross along all the biological levels, but it also helps to identify the knowledge gaps because you can look into the literature, it's based on what's in the literature, what is known, what has been already produced, if we have evidence that this causal relationship is strong or weak. And then when the evidence are weak, that gives us areas to focus the research effort. And actually the different AOP that are currently uh, developed or are in development can be found on a, a open access platform that is called AOP Wiki and you have the QR code here. So this uh, platform but itself as well works as a collaborative uh, platform where everyone can access, check the AOP, but also uh, propose some improvement for the AOP when new information become available. This is why back in the early times of the pandemic, uh, some people working uh, nanotoxicologists at Karolinska Institute, Pain in Mars, said, but what is happening with this virus of COVID-19 really looks like the mechanisms looks like what I do observe in, in the lungs with my nanoparticles. So that's why we thought that AOP could really be a framework to organize all this information, all this production of knowledge, this tsunami of data about the COVID-19 pathogenesis that were coming from different sources. Because by, by essence, as I said, AOP do integrate, does integrate data from different research area and methods. And this is what we called uh, the CHAO project. So that started in April 2020. And CHAO was really a living experiment in interdisciplinary collaboration because more than 75 scientists were collaborating together uh, during around uh, three years on a voluntary basis on top of the daily job. They come from different disciplines, but also different type of institution. And this is only one example of one of the AOP we developed uh, within the project, because I have not the time to go through all of them. So I picked one that is more related to um, um, somehow the neural aspect. So you will dig into the literature, see, propose some biological possibility of a pathway, look at the evidence, and then identify the knowledge gap. And this one was focused on the adverse outcome that is a short-term anosmia. So maybe some of you 
experienced this uh, loss of smell uh, when they had uh, COVID, but then uh, disappear after a while. And let's have a, a look here at this olfactory neuroepithelium uh, that is really located at the uh, rooftop of the nasal cavity. It's quite a complex epithelium, but here there are two cells of its transverse here, the sustentacular cells, which is really the cell that will structure the epithelium and the olfactory sensory neurons that will bring the message to the brain. And actually the, the sustentacular cells, they do express uh, the receptor for the virus, so the ACE2 receptor. So there were some uh, evidence in the literature that showed that then the virus can really enter into those cell replicates and that leads to the death of those cells that disorganize the whole epithelium that leads to a functional impairment of the olfactory uh, sensory neuron. But these uh, cells could regenerate and this is why this anosmia is only short term. And the mechanism behind the long term anosmia is really uh, different. And this uh, type of AOP uh, were built and the evidence were collected thanks to uh, the working groups here. That to give you some example of the different disciplines we had around the table, we have Ali and Katya that were a biomedical researcher from Finland that really take the cells from this neuroepithelium and look how permissive they are to SARS-CoV-2, how they do react to air pollution. But then Francesca de Bernardi, she is a medical doctor and in a hospital in Italy where she really treat patient with anosmia and, and Magdalena, for example, is really an expert in this AOP concept. This is just to, to cite some of them. Uh, but we had also a great interest in, in understanding why some people are more vulnerable than others, because it was obvious for COVID-19 that the um, uh, outcome vary ranges from asymptomatic to death. So we looked into the modulating factor. So um, there are some that could be intrinsic like age, sex, or genetics, as we say, but even pre-existing comorbidities. And one that I can cite here, it's really the gut dysbiosis. So if before that you were infected with, with the virus, you had already an alteration of your gut microbiota, that could really modulate uh, the way you will react to the infection. But there are also some external factor that can modulate uh, the way the virus, um, the body will react to the virus. It's for example, exposure to air pollution or exposure to some chemicals. And here we looked at exposure to PFAS. And so we had uh, data showing that there is indeed older men are more vulnerable than um, other to fatal severe disease. But then we were interested in using the different AOPs, uh, the different pathological pathway described by the other working group in the project to really look into the literature where in this different step, those different factors do modulate the different step of the pathway so that at the end, it does have a uh, different impact on the adverse outcome, which was here, uh, this cytokine storm or the hyperinflammation, so an excessive uh, inflammation uh, response, uh, human response of the body. So the AOP can enhance the understanding the histosome and its impact on adverse outcome. But this was really uh, the first time or in the CHOW project, we really paved the way on how to use those, how to integrate those modulating factor, but there are still somehow um, some uh, challenges uh, to that. And I also mentioned initially that AOPs were really uh, developed to support this uh, paradigm shift towards um, an understanding on the mechanism uh, um, leading to adverse outcome that are triggered by chemical. But here, uh, when we exploit it, when we use the AOP behind the chemicals, that give us opportunity to bridge the knowledge of adversity. Because whether we're exposed to chemicals and no material uh, radiation or virus, that will trigger a response into the body uh, that sometimes could be um, leading to the same perturbation or to the perturbation of the same biological uh, event, uh, like here it's schematized or they exemplify with inflammation. So by considering different type of stressor in the AOP, that could also uh, help us to understand what happened inside the body that is more reflecting the real um, multi-type of stressor or the real scenario, or the exposure that we are really facing as human. But also uh, regarding the team science, we said uh, from the beginning of the project, we said that the process of how we work together was as interesting as the output that I just uh, presented you. So we we were lucky to have uh, beyond uh, us in, in our group, Anna, Anna Maria Carusi, who is a 
a philosopher and social scientist really interested to understand how scientists work together or even how efficiently scientists work together. So we really dig into the different ingredients. And um, honestly, the AOP first was really working as a shared language or a conceptual mediator uh, to put people from discipli different disciplines around the table, but also different disciplines that use sometimes to look at one side of, of the biology, the molecular, the cellular level, or more the clinical symptoms. And so we had to see it. Sometimes it takes time and discussion to really agree on what a, a one word means or what we means when we want to look uh, at this aspect. So it was really a bridge between disciplines. However, still there is a need really for unified terminology. So different participants in child really um, emphasize the necessity for better interdisciplinary communication to in, by improving and by using standard terminology. That makes all the knowledge and the data more fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and at the end reusable between the discipline as well. Uh, in our case, of course, another ingredient was a strong common goal. So it was um, to fight a disease that was a, a pandemic uh, situation that leads to too many deaths. But it was also during a lockdown uh, time. So people were somehow stuck at home. And so there, there were really a strong motivation to do something, to fight, to contribute, to participate, to fight this disease. Um, the model also, our model was interesting. It was as I said, uh, often for most of the people on top of the daily job, so it was a crowdsourcing large scale collaboration models. And when we asked the participant, what is uh, the most rewarding for you to participate in Chao, you can see this uh, word cloud. It was really collaboration, networking, interdisciplinary, but also as we will discuss about credit, it's also the co-authorship and um, the fact that also we, uh, they all feel, and then often mentioned that we had a logo, we had a team, we feel like being part of a community. So the, the people who did participate to Chao are, are really happy and, and, and proud of, of that. But this has to go with terms of collaboration. They should be set at the beginning and they should not be considered as implicit, even if it's a crowdsourcing or based on a voluntary basis. That's maybe the storming step that uh, Cory Kelly mentioned before, that we had to come with these uh, terms of collaboration and also process also to deal with a uh, conflict when they appear, because we were more than 75 scientists coming from different disciplines with different opinions. That's what makes the project successful, but then we need also to have terms of collaboration. And then importantly, as uh, Karen David mentioned, uh, the, we believe that one important ingredient uh, why 75 scientists stay and, and collaborate during these three years, it's because we had a strong but agile central organization. So the, the different scientists uh, were working in different smaller working groups, either depending on the organ of interest, like the neuro group, I presented the short-term anosmia, or so depending on some aspect of the project, like the modulating factor I just mentioned. And for each of these uh, working group, we had one coordinator that was also uh, participating to the coordination group that met twice a month. And I was uh, really uh, making all this concept um, agile, but centralized and harmonized because we had a coordinator that was a scientific coordinator for each of the working group working individually, but then also a coordinator that was more administrative coordinator that uh, make sure that we did organize, for example, twice a year, um, a virtual workshop of two days where we all gather together to present what we were doing, to harmonize the way we were working, to present the different challenge. We also had uh, every week a child internal newsletter to be able to communicate uh, the different aspect between the different working groups. Again, if we were uh, some challenge or the progress of the paper. And most of the people, as I said, were uh, there uh, not paid. I was the only one uh, paid full time to really coordinate uh, everything. And what I used to say, um, being a coordinator or coordinating such a, a project is really acting uh, like an enzyme. So when all the reagents are present together, it's just a, a needed catalyst that push the reaction uh, to happen. So how to catalyze an interdisciplinary collaboration in our um, experience? 
in this uh, Chao uh, lesson learned that we could share. It's really that the AOP framework is really useful, instrumental as a shared language, as a conceptual mediator or bridge between disciplines. But there was also motivation of the participant in this pandemic context that was a strong common goal. Um, also, the terms of the large-scale collaboration needs to be set and to be clear. And then this strong and central organization and ongoing support that in that case was really uh, possible thanks to the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. So maybe to conclude, um, I would like to finish with uh, this, that AOP to bridge disciplines, it's an affair that is worth to remember uh, at the, the model can be applied to anything where one thing leads to another, or even uh, when one thing is followed by the other. So this is the process uh, description. But the framework can be applied to anything where interdisciplinary collaboration, knowledge synthesis, or implicit peer review are necessary. And this is more the social aspect of the uh, AOP. And then the content can be applied far beyond bioscience, far beyond chemicals first, but also far beyond bioscience. And this is the knowledge uh, sharing aspect. And so I will finish by saying that uh, interdisciplinarity is first for me a people journey. So it's possible only thanks to all the participants, the 75 participants that I named here, that really wanted to share, to learn from each other and to be part of this journey. So I have to, to finish my presentation by taking the opportunity to find uh, all of them again. And I'm happy to take any question. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are any questions from the panelists. So I had a I had a question. Um, Please go ahead. Yeah, my my question would be about. I mean, this is really just really remarkable. And how did did you mention that a lot of the people that were participating we're not getting paid. <laughs> and I'm just no, thinking all of, about, none well, of them. Yeah, it was on a voluntary basis. Yeah, I, and I'm just trying to figure out how that would work here. But it's something to think about and something to try to <laughs> make happen. So yeah, but really, really awesome. This is this is good stuff here. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wright. Yeah, thank you for that excellent talk. I, I, I was so excited to hear this because um, there was just a silver lining to the pandemic. It allowed us to peek behind the curtain and really see what team science can do when we are truly focused you know, on, a, on a one purpose. And it had to happen and everybody sort of was on it. And you exemplify that in, in what you accomplished and how you pulled this team together and organized. That was kind of going on lots of places. Um, what, you know, I think we should all be learn, taking those lessons learned and not losing that potential. Uh, we talk about this all the time at our own institution and in our bigger groups. And that I, I thank you for that. And it's something we should come back to, I think, when we do do the panel discussion, because uh, there were definitely lessons learned there. Thank you for your comment. And actually, as I said, we were really interested in the outputs that I could not present all of them, of course, but also by the process. And, and we really want to continue to share um, the lesson learns. Uh, and that's why we really try to understand the ingredients. We have publication that you, we invite people to, to read. But as I said, also one of the ingredients was this specific pandemic time. So that was also something to, to take into consideration. It was a specific right. moment in life. But to be excited about the potential of team science. I mean, it, we saw it in operation. And the, but then lots of us did things that were unfunded mandates, right? Because we, we wanted to roll up our sleeves, be involved. What you're talking about here in NINDS, to put funding behind that now, right? Because you can't do that outside of the pandemic. We do have to you know, you know, pay the bills or get things done. So, but, but I think what the takeaway is, is that one purpose, 
The team is focused and how much can be accomplished in a very short period of time, relatively. And that's what we're trying to do here to make real impacts for exposomics in, in neurological diseases, yeah. Great, and let's definitely follow up more on this during the discussion. Um, for people that are entering questions or that can, you know, have questions, um, we're going to move on for now. Um, you know, we can come back to these during the discussion, or we can um, uh, answer them in the Q and A box uh, asynchronously. Thank you very much, Dr. Clerbo. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. J. K. Lee. Christine E. Lynn, Distinguished Professor in Neuroscience at the University of Miami School of Medicine. He has spent his entire research career on the pathobiology of spinal cord injury, and his current research focuses on how the glial and immune response after spinal cord injury can be therapeutically targeted. Dr. Lee's talk is titled, Fails and Some Successes in Team Neuroscience. Dr. Lee. Hey, thank you, Neil, for the kind introduction. Let me share my slide. Okay, so I think it's being shared. Yeah, hey, uh, thanks again for the invitation. When um, Aaron and Col Corey emailed me uh, about this talk, I, I really don't didn't know kind of uh, what to expect in terms of the content. It was a truly a unique. Um, opportunity. So I, I hope that I get to meet all of your expectations today. I'll start with my disclaimer slide. Uh, so uh, this is really my uh, own lived experience. It doesn't represent um, the, the views expressed by anyone else but me. Um, so I just I'm, my hope is just that there might be some of you who can learn from uh, by mistake and I, as the title reflects uh, some successes. Um, the uh, disclosure is that I don't I have no financial uh, gain from any of the slides that I'm about to present today. Um, so I guess this is a little bit different in that um, I'm supposed to kind of present the aspect from my view as an awardee of this award. Uh, so I'll start with kind of my lab uh, and kind of what we do. Uh, this is a bit of an outdated picture. There have been some recent uh, members that have joined. But um, you know, this is my team that of, of uh, trainees, graduate students, postdoc, and uh, scientists in my lab that tries to tackle a um, a, a big problem in the uh, field of uh, neuroscience, which is that uh, you know there is no cure for spinal cord injury, and and so this has been true uh, for <laughs> forever. Um, there is no treatment. Uh, there are no therapeutics. Um, so this particular biology of spinal cord injury that I study is that of the injury site. So what is uh, happening during the wound healing process after spinal cord injury? After the initial injury, there's inflammation, cell proliferation, and tissue remodeling that leads to, let me turn my laser pointer. Um, that leads to what we typically call a scar in the field um, that's comprised of both neural cells, glial cells like astrocytes and microglia and oligodendrocyte progenitor cells that surround a, a central core of non-neural cells, comprised mainly of macrophages and, and fibroblasts. And so that's kind of the biology that I study. And um, uh, you know, I think most, if not all, of us in the field realize that in order for us to make any gains in this field in terms of uh, discovering our therapeutic, that we really need to work with others, um, especially those that are outside our field, to give us new insights um, into how we might find the treatment. Um, and so uh, you've heard a lot about why team science is important, um, I think. Different people will give you, um, you know, different answers, and I think all of them, uh, many of them, are, are correct. Kind of, you know, my view on on team science has been that it really promotes creativity and innovation. Um, you know, things that we wouldn't have thought of ourselves if we interact with other people. You know, there's a light bulb that goes off in our head, and and we come up with new and innovative ideas to tackle an old problem, um, and 
you know, Steve Jobs uh, once said that creativity is just connecting things. And in the context of neuroscience, which I believe a large portion of the audience is uh, from today, you know, that has a special meaning. Right? So connecting things in a brain, the, the, the connectome and, and, and uh, um, you know, the, that, so we kind of have an understanding of what connection means in terms of neurons and how those are certainly important for the circuitry of, circuitry of the nervous system. You know, but we as scientists connect things all the time. So if you have a group of people, you know, and, and you just and you just think about your own scientific careers, we've all connected dots, um, whether it's within our field or um, across our fields, you know, and, and we come up with new ideas when, when we try to do that. So, you know, I, I study the immune response after nervous system injury, spinal cord injury, but, you know, as I, I received so my PhD is in neuroscience, and and when I was doing my PhD courses, you know we learned barely any immunology, right? But I find myself right in the middle of studying the immune response after uh, central nervous system injury, and so you know I've been forced to connect those dots between neuroscience and immunology, um, and and I've had to learn also a lot about cell biology. So as you know, neuroscientists, the emphasis really on neurons. Well, you know, neurons don't move or the, and they don't divide, right? Whereas a lot of glial cells do. And so if I've had to, um, you know, teach myself and interact with a lot of cell biologists to really learn about basic cell biology that drives the glial and the immune response after CNS injury. And so we all make these, you know, connections between dots. But when we work as a group, right, the hope is that all of these dots that we see and connect individually will come together into a much clearer picture that provides an, 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 a, a bigger impact to the field that we're in. And, and this is kind of the significance, uh, you know, that's all usually we have to address in our, our NIH applications, right? And so we're able to address very significant problems, just like Dr. Klebro just described during the COVID times. When we come together to bring all of our resources and our past experiences to connect the dots in order to make this big, solve, tackle these big picture problems. Um, so this is kind of quote unquote hypothetical um, attempt right, at, at uh, tackling in, uh, into connecting these dots as, as a team. Um, so one day, scientist one or A says, hey, I, I have an idea, right? And so this is just during a conversation that we might have with our colleagues during a meeting, um, conferences, uh, or when you have an invited speaker, you have, ideas, you, have, you have an idea. You present the idea and your um, collaborator, friend or colleague says, hey, I know somebody you should collaborate with that can help you with that idea, right? And, and so you uh, recruit a team, okay? And you have this vision of what this uh, problem you're going to solve and how you're going to do it. And you write your uh, NIH application and then and, and you get it uh, funded. Everyone's excited and you start to do your project and, and kind of uh, uh, progress you know, with the experiments that you proposed. And when you initially start, obviously, you know, hopefully everyone starts with a clear vision, a clear goal, clear picture of what it is that we're trying to tackle. Um, and then, you know, we get to the year two of the uh, 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 funding period. And, you know, the NIH gives its awardees a lot of freedom to pursue new directions. Um, it's not like a contract, right? So we have this freedom, but you know, I think that freedom kind of is both a blessing and a curse. Um, so, you know, and I think a lot of us probably have experienced this. And because of this freedom, the each of the team members start to kind of have their own vision about, about what this project is and how it fits into their own professional uh, uh, careers. And, and then over time, right, the original vision, kind of starts to disappear, right? The original goal, the original problem, and the, that vision we've had together kind of starts to disappear. But not only that, members of the team start to kind of fade away as well, right? 
and 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 that member's contribution and that member's vision also starts to fade away and you're left with now um, a much different picture than you initially started with and by the end right it's it can be completely two different visions and completely two different directions that each team member um, uh, is, is is going into and and so you know in retrospect try to figure out what went wrong and there were many things and um, I think some of the things that uh, went wrong is that one there were mismatched expectations a lot of these are some of the things that um, you know the previous speakers already uh, spoke about and so mismatched expectations and, and they kind of arise from the fact that there were ill-defined roles to begin with uh, we think we kind of know what each person or scientist or PI should be doing, um, but you know when you really try to put it on paper, it's 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 really it wasn't clear to begin with. Uh, there was poor communication. Uh, there's usually good communication when you meet. I think the problem is that we tend to we're you know with our busy schedules. I don't I don't think that we meet regularly enough to make sure that everybody's on the same page about the progress of the project. Um, these two, two things tends to lead to a drift in scientific interest, right? So we were doing our experiments. We, we think we're contributing to the goal, but you know, we all have our personal um, biases, whether we're conscious of it or not, and we have our personal goals and interests, right? So if you take three different three scientists from three different fields, they're going to want to view things, view data, and then view experiments and propose new experiments in the context that they're most comfortable with. And that tends to cause drifts. Um, so a history of working together, I think, is extremely important. Um, and, and the fact that the trainees and staff that were involved in the project were not engaged enough. So when we had meetings, it was just with the PIs. And, and I think in retrospect, that was a, 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 a mistake. And so, okay, so then this is now attempt uh, number two through the combined program. So when the when I first received this award, I think this was the first iteration of the program. It was originally called the Interdisciplinary Team Science Program, RM1, um, that has now been uh, 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 branded uh, into the combined program. And as uh, Corey and Kelly described before, um, so this is me um, trying to solve this uh, problem of finding a, a therapeutic for a um, for spinal cord injury. And you know, one of the main issues that we uh, described in our applications, kind of the, the problem, right, is that the problem obviously is that we don't have a therapeutic for spinal cord injury, but a major contributor to this problem, not just spinal cord injury, but I believe this is true for a lot of other neurological disorders, is that you know, as basic scientists, we study a biological process that has relevance to some disease, and that biological process tends to be in a certain cell type. So you might study microglia, you might study neurons, you might study astrocytes, and then you think that, oh, here is a protein that contributes this to this biological process in this particular cell, and if we block this protein with a compound, it improves that biological process and, and, and reduces the disease burden. So great. So then we now um, give this drug to the entire central nervous system, completely disregarding what that drug might have, what effect that drug might have on other cells and other biological processes. Well, similar biological processes, but in other cells. And I'm sure you can think of many examples where a same biological process in two different cell types leads to two different end results. And but this is the kind of approach that you know that 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 we take. Um, so I had a good friend and collaborator, uh, Anagi, who was a colleague of mine at University of Miami and recently moved to Georgetown. He's a cancer biologist. And so and I, I described I kind of told you briefly about the fact that neuroscientists have usually have a poor understanding of how cells proliferate and move, but you know, cancer biologists have a very good idea of how that happens. And Nagi happens to also be involved in drug discovery. So um, Nagi 
uh, came out with this uh, bioinformatic platform where it takes advantage of the Lynx L1000 data set to obtain, use single cell data sets in a, so, so from uh, a single cell type and cal to calculate a disease signature for each cell type, and then uses the L1000 database to uh, predict compounds that might reverse that disease signature. Okay, so that was great because it was tackling a problem that I thought we had in the field, but we had another problem that, okay, so we find the drug, but we still have to give it to the whole body, right? So, so we can find the compound that's specific for a cell, specific cell type, but how are we going to give it to that particular cell? And so then enters Kibon Lee. He's a professor at Rutgers University. He's a chemical biologist by training, and his specialty is in drug delivery systems, especially pertaining to nanoparticles. So I had collaborated with Kibon for a while. We've had papers and grants together. Um, and so because I, so I served as the middle person between this team, Nagi and Kibon had never they had met, but never really collaborated. And so I pulled this team together to tackle this common problem. It's one simple problem of let's try to find a drug to, to treat spinal cord injury in a cell type specific manner. And so that has the kind of the title of um, the, the application. And so I kind of described uh, this process to you already. We've, uh, so we're taking single cell and spatial transcriptomics data set so that we can get cell type, cell type specific information. Uh, we, Put it through uh, a, a novel uh, bioinformatics platform where we'll take that disease signature to predict compounds that might reverse it. And then we uh, make novel drug discovery platforms and nanoparticles that will be tested in animal models of spinal cord injury. Um, and so this conversation obviously, not, well, not obviously, but started just like the other one. You know, Nagi said, Nagi, we had this discussion. Nagi said, hey, I have this idea, right? And so, and then I said, hey, I know somebody we should collaborate with. And that's when Kibam joined um, the team. And so the three of us now, uh, you know, share a, a common vision, okay? Um, and in order for, for us, the three of us to really main, to make sure that we maintain this vision, right? Uh, we knew that we had to make well-defined roles and expectations for our project. And so when we wrote the application, uh, you know, we pay, we spent a lot of time writing and detailing the statement of work. Um, and, and so kind of, you know, where I learned what a statement of work was when I was writing uh, applications for Department of Defense, it's re required for, for DOD applications. And, and, and so kind of, I, I took my experience writing statement of work for DOD applications and, and try to apply it in, in this, uh, with this collaboration. We established quarterly milestones, um, and and you know we we told ourselves that it's on paper now, but this is a living document. Um, but you know, it, and it can be modified as a living document, but it needs to be modified as a team uh, and, and not as individuals. Um, and so this is kind of you know if you if you're familiar with DoD applications, you may have seen this you know, kind of a. The, the, the style. Um, and so, you know, we spent a lot of time drafting this. And I, I and as well as the can chart that Corey and uh, Karen mentioned before. Um, and, and so, you know, we told ourselves that this is now going to serve as our North Star so that whenever, you know, we uh, are, are kind of facing issues with progress or directions, we're going to refer back to this. In fact, we refer back to this uh, regularly. Um, and that gets to kind of my uh, next learning learn experience, which is uh, establishing effective means of communication. So I think this is also really, really essential to a successful collaboration. Um, and uh, we say we're going to communicate, um, but we don't I don't think we give up enough ourselves enough infrastructure for this to occur. So I think one thing that you know that we as a team uh, kind of told ourselves is that, we're going to have a week regularly scheduled meeting every two weeks. Obviously, when we uh, launched the project, it was weekly, uh, but then it moved to um, bi-weekly. Um, and then <clears throat> we designated our project manager, which is uh, required for this RML mechanism. 
uh, to take careful meeting notes, and there are lots of resources on how to take meeting notes appropriately. And then, uh, but you know, we don't want to just communicate every two weeks. We want to make sure that there is a mechanism for ongoing communication. Um, and so we are we utilize Slack for that. So when we have new data that we're excited about or just something communications that we want to send out to the group, uh, we use Slack to do that. Um, and you know, it's, I think it's really, really important that we keep our the, the team, the trainees and and other staff members engaged in our in in, in the project. Uh, they actually seem to enjoy it very well. Um, I think the impression that I've had so far is that, um, they really like learning about other fields. They like being part of this novel experience where it's truly interdisciplinary um, and, and truly a, a teamwork. I think they like participating and learning about how to do this. Um, but this takes a lot of resources. And, and so if, you know, I think if you estimate that, you know, percent effort, you're going to be spending 25%, you should probably put about 20% more than that because working as a team takes a lot more effort than working alone. And you really need to set that time aside um, to, to allow yourself to do that. Um, and so, you know, these, these are the things that, uh, uh, that I think has been helping us so far. Um, and I will stop there because of time, except one more slide, sorry. Uh, so this is the actual team. Um, the PIs I've introduced before, but there are uh, many other, um, the, the, which I should emphasize a diverse team uh, across um, race and fields and, and professional status. Um, and so these are the people that have been uh, contributing to this project so far, and I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I, we have time for maybe one, short question. I don't know if there are any, or we can just reserve them for the general discussion. Okay. Um, There's one question in the chat for right, Dr. Lee. Right. Yeah. So Dr. Lee, the, the question in the chat says, uh, do you have did you have meetings that combined in-person and remote participants? And are there any lessons uh, that you uh, have to share from that? Right, so because of time, uh, yes. Uh, so our bi-weekly meetings are through Zoom because of geographic reasons, um, but our kickoff meeting uh, was in person. Uh, and, and that was fortuitous because it all happened to, last year's SFN happened to be in DC. And because one of the PIs is in Georgetown, we kind of had a chance to meet there. That uh, so, and then from that, based on that experience, we told ourselves that we're going to have annual uh, in-person meetings uh, because it was such a, 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 a fruitful event, especially for the trainees. And so we're going to try to have our annual meetings in person. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay. So moving to the next talk. Uh, next, we have Dr. Heidi Baumgartner, a research scholar at Stanford University. She is the co-director of the Stanford Big Team Science Lab and executive director of the Many Babies Program, an international collaborative, uh, an international collaborative network in developmental psychology research. Dr. Baumgartner will give a talk titled Recognizing and Rewarding Contributions to Large-Scale Collaborations. Hi, thanks so much. Um, can you see my slides okay? Um, yeah, they're great. Okay, great. Uh, so let me start out by thanking the organizers for inviting me to talk to you guys today. Um, I'm Heidi Baumgartner. I'm a research scholar working at Stanford and I'm a experimental developmental psychologist by training. And uh, my main job is as the executive director of a large collaborative network of developmental psychologists called Many Babies. So I'll talk today about some work that colleagues and I have done recently regarding um, recognizing and rewarding contributions in these large scale collaborations. Um, this is just my disclaimer, I have no, no conflicts to disclose. Um, I wanna just start by acknowledging the folks whose work I'll be talking about today. So a few of us 
who are based at Stanford started a group a couple of years ago called the Big Team Science Lab. And we invited people who are working in various big team science efforts to join us. Um, and so some of the work that I'll be talking about stems from work that this group has done amongst, amongst our larger collaborative teams as well. Uh, just a quick outline, I'll start with a very brief overview of my group, Many Babies, and then I'll talk about some challenges of recognizing contributions and large scale con uh, collaborations, and then move on to some tools um, that we use and sort of propose solutions that could be implemented in the future. So just to start a quick introduction to Many Babies. So inspired by sort of increased awareness in uh, psychology and social sciences and sciences uh, more broadly of issues with reproducibility, replicability and generalizability um, and other collaborative efforts that were already happening to address these issues. Um, most notably the Many Labs project and the 2015 Open Science Collaboration project. Um, Many Babies was formed by a small group of developmental psychologists who first, you know, started with some informal discussions and then um, there was a blog post that got disseminated and then there were some, you know, more, more formal discussions, um, which led to the formation of a listserv, which um, to date is now a network of over 640 contributors based in 50 countries around the world and working on over 25 projects together. So we've really grown a lot in a relatively short amount of time. Here's just a visualization of our current main projects. Um, the top row are what we call our empirical projects. The bottom row are what we call our methodological projects. Uh, most of them have spin-off projects that are associated with them. And then I have a link up at the top of the page uh, with some information um, more information about the projects if you're interested. Hopefully the link to these slides has been put in the chat so that everyone can access the links that are in these slides. Um, so we've called projects like ours, uh, big team science projects, which combine resources, tools, and expertise through ultra large collaborations. So I'm sure that this group, um, is already aware of a lot of what uh, is on this slide, but just a few benefits of big team science projects. You know, you can have collaborative study design, you can have large um, sample sizes, you can develop sort of consensus based best practices, um, you can investigate sources of variability, um, like uh, that are, have to do with. Um, maybe lab differences or other differences. Um, you can increase the diversity, not just of the population that you're studying, but also the researchers involved in the project and the research questions that are being asked. And um, for our group and a lot of the groups that we partner with, um, open science is very central to our mission. And so we um, work hard to create reproducible pipelines, open sharing of data code, and study materials to benefit the field at large. But there's a question that remains is why should individual researchers participate in these projects? This has come up in a couple of the talks already, question of incentive. So um, just a few that I've thrown on this slide, uh, network building, helping you know to work on large collaborative projects that would be outside the scope of an individual lab to help move the field forward. And at an individual level, you know, like a lot of things that scientists do, an incentive is uh, something relevant to career advancement. And in in the sciences, this often is documented in the form of authorship. So the first question that comes up when talking about authorship, not just in a big team science con context, is how to define requirements for authorship. So as I'm sure you all know, this isn't always a question with a clear answer. Um, there isn't consensus about what, um, what authorship should mean or what the requirements should be across disciplines, even within disciplines, across journals, different world regions, or even within a, a team. So don't worry about reading all of this text right now, but I just wanted to show two different sets of authorship guidelines. One on the left is the 
International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, and on the right is Nature Portfolio to in illustrate how these guidelines can differ in very important ways. So I'll just highlight here in red, you can see on the left that ICMJE includes drafting or editing the manuscript as a necessary criterion for authorship, whereas Nature um, puts drafting or revising the manuscript in the same category as other contribution types like conceptualization or data acquisition, meaning that, you know, actually writing the manuscript is not a necessary requirement for authorship. So that's a pretty substantial difference right there. Um, and then one more example is that ICMJE requires that authors should be accountable for all aspects of the work, regardless of the scope of their own contributions, whereas Nature, on the other hand, limits an author's uh, personal accountability to their own contributions. Um, and so for really large scale collaborations, you can see this would have big implications. You know, it's not always feasible for every member of a super large collaborative project to be personally accountable for all aspects of the work given the distributed nature of these projects. Um, so coming back to this slide about the lack of consensus, we generally see that authorship is generally used to assume to mean that someone has um, both contributed to the outcome described in the paper and agrees with the content of the paper and assumes some form of responsibility. Uh, but are these the right assumptions, um, especially in the case of large collaborations? So our group has recently been thinking about this question. We have this commentary that came out last year um, and we talk about how big team science can challenge traditional assumptions about authorship. Um, and we have another paper that also came out last year where we sort of compiled some of the our experiences into practical advice into starting and managing large scale collaborations. Um, so with regards to authorship, we identify three ways that big team science challenges authorship. So I'll go through each of these pretty quickly. Um, the first challenge is how to define authorship worthy contributions. So big team science often calls on contributing researchers to take on specialized roles such as developing statistical models, collecting data, or managing infrastructure. Uh, while you might fill all of these roles for a typical project within your own lab, you might only take on one or a subset of those roles in a big team science project. So even more so than in single lab projects, there can be ambiguity around which contributions are authorship worthy. So for example, do contributing to things like translations or project management, or infrastructure development count as an authorship worthy contribution to a project. Um, moreover, this ambiguity tends to be, um, it tends to disproportionately harm less powerful researchers, including those from underrepresented groups and early career researchers who might not have the sort of knowledge of the, the unwritten rules uh, behind authorship or don't have you know, experience or you know, powerful mentors to advocate for them. Um, so in general, ambiguity tends to serve those who are already in positions of power and disproportionately harms those who are not. Um, so one solution that's come up in a number of the talks already today and that I really advocate for are collaboration agreements, which um, documents clearly defined roles and responsibility as well as requirements for authorship um, and this should these things should be clearly defined and shared with all both current and prospective members of a research team as early as possible and throughout the project. Okay, so actually, I think Corey um, shared sort of a, a screenshot of our collaboration in his talk earlier. This is a lot of text to be on a slide. Don't worry about reading this. There's a link at the top where you can view this on your own time if you'd like. But I just wanted to show, you know, we have sections on expected conduct of participants, um, the anticipated pro products of the collaboration, various roles and responsibilities, how authorship is defined and the planned authorship order, things like that. And again, as Jay just mentioned, we consider these to be living documents. Purpose of this from our perspective is not to be like a formal legal contract. It's rather meant to be a transparent outline of project expectations as a way of reducing ambiguity 
um, and ensuring that all collaborators on the same page as authorship. Um, I sometimes think about this as sort of like project insurance. So it gives you a chance early on to think about, you know, what your plans are, what could potentially go wrong and gives you a way to think about um, how you'll handle disagreements um, as they come up rather than waiting until something has gone wrong, by which time it's kind of too late to plan for. Okay, and here, so that was our collaboration agreement. I'm actually, we've been thinking about trying to reformat and simplify, our, simplify ours. And I recently became aware of this document called the Open Science Team Agreement, which is drafted by the Bay Area Open Science Group. I highly recommend checking out this great resource um, at, at the link I've provided there. Um, it covers similar things as our collaboration agreement um, and is just a really great tool for any type of large team. And I will say, not just large teams, I advocate for the, these types of agreements, even in single lab settings. Again, any way that you can reduce ambiguity um, and anticipate issues, uh, it might seem like overkill if you're working with a small team, but um, it it's really a, a great resource to have. Okay, so moving on to the next challenge, which is, okay, once you've decided what an authorship worthy contribution is, how do you document it? Um, so our group, as well as many of our peer groups have adopted the contributor roles taxonomy for, uh, known as credit. This has also come up in and I know a number of the talks, this has become the standard across a number of fields in science. Um, so there's 14 categories. If you're not familiar with it, there's a link there to the, the NISO website that uh, has a better description of the taxonomy. But you know, there are different categories and they've provided a short description of what those categories mean. Um, and so the idea is that if everybody is working on the, from the same taxonomy, then it's easier to interpret what um, an individual's contribution to a project means in this sort of shared language. Um, when we decided to adopt credit with our group as our default tracking system just a few years ago, it was a relatively um, unfamiliar tool to most of our contributors, but it's quickly become the standard tool that we're seeing that many journals are requiring um, at the time of submission. So I've just put up on the screen here a list of publishers who have adopted this tool. Um, and actually this screenshot is from close to a year ago. So it's probably a longer list of journals here, but you can see some very familiar, familiar names. So if you yourself haven't already been asked to provide credit info with a submission, you likely soon will be. Um, so as you can imagine, the larger number of contributors you have working on a project, the harder it is to keep track of these contributions. So what our group has done is we've created an online form where we ask all contributors to any of our projects to fill out the form where they provide some information, including their affiliations, their ORCID, um, and they report their level of contribution to each of the 14 credit categories. So what we've done is we've also gone ahead in addition to the credit description, we've added a little blurb that is listed here as the MB note, MB for many babies, where we've gone ahead and added how the, that category typically applies to one of our projects. Because sometimes it's not always um, incredibly straightforward because the taxonomy was written to apply to lots of different um, domains. So once people have filled out that form, their, their entries populate a table, which is publicly accessible on our website. So all of these reports are totally transparent. Anybody who's participating in the project can view their own contribution as well as everybody else else's reports um, from the project. And um, again, this is just part of our our commitment to being as open and transparent as possible. Uh, once you've got sort of a spreadsheet with all of this info, there's a really great handy web tool that's called Tenzing that um, you can use to easily compile this information into a publication friendly format. So here's what their provided template. They provide a, a Google Sheet template, or I believe they have a CSV file that you can download. Um, so you can just 
transfer your information in, into this type of spreadsheet, upload it to their web app, and then you can download the output that you want in a number of nice formats. So you can get author contributions by credit category. So you might have seen tables like this in publications. Um, you can get a table, a, a list of the contributors affiliations. It does all of the formatting with the superscripts and numbering for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, you can export all of the funding information that people report. You can export an XML file that can be provided directly to publishers um, and a YAML file that generates code. Like if you're writing your manuscript using LaTeX or R Markdown. Um, so as you can imagine, like, you know, you know how hard it is to put this information into a cover page for a pub, uh, publication with uh, not that many collaborators. Once you start scaling up, this, uh, to this tool can save you a lot of time. Um, and then if something changes, it's easy to just update that spreadsheet and re-export all of these tables. Um, and then just very quickly, we have sort of this idea that's floated around our group of, you know, using the credit reports to create something that's more akin to something like the Internet Movie Database. So if you go to imdb.com, you can see all of the people who participated in a given project. Um, actors, crew members organized by their role. You can click on someone's name to see what else that person has done, a bio, um, other projects they've worked on in that same role or in other roles. So it, it's, it's nice to imagine a not too distant future where we can use credit information in this way to add to our databases where people's contributions to projects are very transparent and um, searchable in this way. Okay, and then just the last question that I wanna uh, bring up is how to handle disagreements. So again, this has been touched on earlier, but um, what seems like a pretty obvious statement is as, as teams get larger, the number of collaborators increases and the probability of disagreements occurring gets higher as well. So collaborators might disagree with, you know, the, the logic of a proposition, phrasing in the manuscript, all of this stuff. So there, there are a number of ways we've identified to think about handling these things. So um, one really important thing to do is define how your group is gonna make decisions. So you can say you're gonna use a consensus-based model, but does that mean decisions have to be unanimous, overwhelming majority, simple majority? It's important to make that decision and lay it out in your collaboration agreement. Another option is to try and resolve disputes using a neutral arbiter where both parties can sort of make their argument and agree to rule by a stand by the arbiter's ruling. So a lot of people have experienced this as a very effective means where a lot of people just wanna feel like their argument has been heard and considered um, rather than ignored or dismissed. And this can help head off disagreements as well. And then another idea is to allow for like dissenting opinions again, to allow for people to participate in these projects without, without feeling like they have to rubber stamp everything that the main group decides on. So just very quickly, the last takeaways, whatever you decide, transparency is really key. Make decisions on how you're gonna define authorship, define contributions and handle disagreements as early as possible and document all of these decisions in a collaboration agreement that's shared openly. And again, these don't have to be specific to large team science. These are great tools to use in your own labs as well. Um, and lastly, I'll just say, if you're interested in learning more about the Big Team Science Lab or we put on an annual conference that we call the Big Team Science Conference, please visit those links and I'd be happy to talk with anyone who's interested. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, we have time for one quick question. I don't know if there's, oh, uh, Pam, you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks. So great presentation, Heidi, really cool stuff you guys are doing. Um, I just wondered, have you, how do you decide authorship order if you have a large paper with a gazillion people on it? And is it possible to use the credit? Um, whatever Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is you're putting together to try and figure out uh, order of authorship on a paper? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So generally the way our projects work is each project has a leadership, a core leadership team that consists of three to six people, I would say. And so generally um, on our, our existing publications, those people serve as like the first and final author positions, depending, you know, sort of those groups decide on their own the best way to do that. Um, we have a couple papers with shared first authors because there are leads who have really served in that role. Um, and then we might have another group of authors that appear right after the first authors of people who led working groups or made significant contributions in another way. Um, and then we'll have the bulk of the contributors that appear in alphabetical or reverse alphabetical or some other sort of random method that's predetermined. Um, but you can certainly think about using the credit reports to do that. So far, it's worked for us to just have those groups be defined by the leadership group and by the teams themselves. Um, but regardless of the authorship ordering, um, we'd have that that credit report that shows on the, a granular, granular level which categories each person contributed to. Great, thank you. Yeah. Let me do, just real quick stay. Um, great, thanks Heidi. And I was just curious about, um, and I put this in the chat about, would the contributors know where they're gonna be on a paper before they agree to join your team? And I know that's kind of a weird question, but it could that could come about there. So, yeah. yeah, so again, we, um, we try to have that uh, collaboration agreement drafted as early in the process as possible. So um, yeah, the transparency is key there. We we don't necessarily have it ironed out the exact list and the the people who people join our projects at there is the list is constantly in flux of people joining the project as it goes along. So generally um, people don't know their exact place in the authorship order, but by having that collaboration agreement, it's a nice way for everybody to sort of know, okay, this is the method that's going to be used to determine authorship order. And people can know that before deciding to get involved. Okay, I'll follow up in the chat. Aaron, when we discuss it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baumgartner. Welcome back. The last presentation is from Dr. L. Michelle Bennett. Dr. Bennett is currently principal and owner of L.M. Bennett Consulting, having departed her position as director of the Center for Research Strategy at the National Cancer Institute in 2021. While at NIH, Dr. Bennett's passions pulled her to focus on effective research collaboration, science administration, and executive coaching. This combination provided her with opportunities to grow into leadership roles that focused on strategic scientific planning, creating conditions for successful interdisciplinary collaboration, workforce diversity, and health disparities, as well as organizational change management and development in research institutions. She has extensive practical experience in promoting collaboration and team-based approaches by bringing together research scientists with diverse backgrounds and expertise across many dimensions of difference. She co-authored Collaboration and Team Science, a field guide that serves as a primer for investigators who are building or participating on research teams. Today, she'll be talking about how collaboration thrives on productive conflict. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil. Um, and I and I am sorry, I guess I want to say that I actually changed my title after I had a chance to see the speakers and to learn a little bit more about um, what you were hoping to hear from me. So I'm going to get my slides up. And while I'm doing that, I just want to thank you all so much for inviting me to participate. This has been a really amazing um, series so far. I've really enjoyed listening to all of the talks and um, hearing the exchange of um, ideas. Um, so I think I'm going to start this off by saying that, uh, and maybe even reiterating some of the things that folks have said, in that 
the three examples that we heard of these of the teams that are being led um, are just phenomenal. I've enjoyed each of the presentations so much, and I'm so impressed by what each of you have done. It's it's hard to even put into words. And so I think the main message that I want to convey in saying that is that these aren't the kinds of teams that you need to worry about. It's really the teams who are that are struggling to figure out how are we going to work together as a team. Um, people who don't have these natural abilities or recognize the the nece necessity of of combining both the science with uh, being attentive to the people and their needs and learning how to work with each other as they're starting to work with each other. So I think I, my talk is going to focus a little bit on that because there are a lot of people out there who start teams and are not successful in um, really getting to a successful uh, conclusion with them or even able to sustain them. So I titled my talk Neural Exposomics as a Team Science or retitled it, Neil, sorry about that, um, because as I was preparing for this talk, it became really clear to me, I think, that um, NINDS was really interested in trying to understand, you know, how are we going to put team science into practice through the neural exposome and neural exposomics? And so I, I wanted to address that a little bit more directly. So disclaimer, um, views are my own, and I have no financial relationship to anything I'm going to present per se, but I do want to own up that I'm starting my own consulting practice that does focus on helping individuals, teams, and organizations integrate collaborative principles into scientific endeavors. So like team science, neural exposomics requires a number of things, which has led me to title my talk the way I did. Neural exposomics requires the integration of frameworks from across the disciplinary spectrum, from basic science to clinical research. And I think we've seen a number of examples of that through the different talks that we've heard. Um, I'm, I have focused mostly on interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research and how those teams functions function and how they are successful. And for those of you not familiar with the vocabulary of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research, I'll explain that to you in a moment. Um, neural exposomics really requires the incorporation of team science principles into research collaborations. And I think we've heard that mentioned along the way. It is essential that there be productive conflict across differences. I think one thing that I hear a lot of people talk about and mention is this the issue of conflict. You know, what do we do when there's conflict? Um, I will say to you that you want conflict in your teams. You want to bring together people who are thinking differently. And the reason that you want to do that is precisely what Jay was talking about. It's when you have people with different perspectives that you're able to make those two connections of the knowns across the unknown to create something new and to be creative and innovative. Uh, you'll need collaboration to solve some really complex scientific challenges. And from what I know and understand of the exposome, not to mention the neural exposome, that's gonna be absolutely essential. And you need a community of practitioners interested in furthering, furthering the field of exposomics. And I heard, I think one of the things I've heard too is how do you recruit more people in neurobiology, the, the neuro fields together and to participate. So when I talk about exposomics being across disciplinary science, this is what I mean, is that there really is a disciplinary continuum from unidisciplinary to multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary. Um, you could call the, the multi to trans as sort of the cross-disciplinary arena or convergent. Um, so really what this means is that as you are increasing the levels of interaction and integration across this continuum, you're really moving from a number of different separate frameworks that sort of exist um, on their own to beginning to be merged a little bit to a whole new framework that is um, unique and distinct to that particular collaboration. 
So I, I spend a lot of time with teams, with organizations, with individuals who are interested in forming teams or have formed teams and have had not so great experiences. And I would say that this is one strategy that a lot of people take when they put together a team. They cross their fingers and they hope it's all going to work out. I don't think, like a lot of the, the investigators that you just heard present, um, that everybody realizes that you can design your team on purpose. You can be very, very purposeful for how you design your team, and it can make a huge difference. So I am a huge proponent of building your collaborations on purpose. So what does this mean for scientists? That means that they really need to be purposeful about establishing their team values and their team norms. We've heard a lot about norming and the, the, the norming phase, which is putting those processes into place, putting the structures into place that is really going to help inform the team and around which the team can agree to implement in order to achieve their goals. What we really haven't heard anybody talk about is what are the values and when I talk about values, I mean the values and beliefs of that team. So as a collective, what are your values? What are your beliefs? And the reason this is so important is that your behavior, what you do as norms, how you get to your norms is all dependent on your mindset in, in being collaborative in nature. If collaboration is really important to you, then those values like transparency, that Heidi was talking about, curiosity like Jay was talking about, um, are all things that cascade from there that enable the team to be really successful. So those values are really the culture of the team. What kind of team culture do you want? So designing the team on purpose can maximize your effectiveness, your productivity, as well as the team dynamic. The other thing that I wanted to say is I think for a lot of scientists, they don't always necessarily understand that uh, they're going to probably end up meeting new people who might not even consider themselves exposome researchers yet. Um, and they probably will be interacting with people from fields that they've never interacted with before. And this is part of the excitement. I think that you've heard in the voices of those who have come before me about the um, opportunities around team science and the value. And then I really like a lot, uh, no surprise to people who might know me, um, that if the team spends time in addressing how they're going to be working together at the start of the collaboration and integrating that, that into how they move forward, it will pay huge dividends in the future. And I think each of these groups that we've heard talk about had some sort of collaboration agreement, um, which does take time, as we've heard, to put into place. It takes everybody's time. But I can, um, I'll give you a bit of a, an example in a second of where that really um, has, we've got some really nice evidence about how beneficial it is. So what does this mean for NINDS? And I tried to think about, like, from a funder's perspective, what, what do you need to think about as you are implementing programs that are incorporating team science or that or science that is team science in and of itself? Um, so I think setting expectations for team science is really important. Um, you're already starting to do this, is requiring um, researchers to submit a collaboration plan in addition to their research plan. I think the only thing I would add on to that is making sure that there are team science experts on review panels. This is something NSF does, and it's really interesting. I've been a, um, a team science expert on a number of panels now. Um, I know very little or anything about the science, but I know about collaboration. And so I can contribute very substantively in predicting how effective the team is gonna be in actually getting the work done that they say they wanna get done. I would say prepare researchers to be effective collaborators. I have a great opportunity on many occasions to run workshops for people who are early in their career. And I hear over and over and over, over again, you know, we don't learn this kind of stuff anywhere. We don't learn about how to collaborate. We don't learn how to be effective. Um, and so being able to work with folks who have that, um, that 
need to learn how to work better together so that when they actually do put teams together, they can be effective right off the bat on attempt number one um, is really powerful. The other thing I would say is work with institutions, associations, other funders to develop strategies for recognizing individuals in the context of the team. Um, I think if I were to make a plea, this would be it. Um, you know, I think I heard earlier this, um, and maybe it was David, and I apologize, David, if I got that wrong, might have been Karen, but, you know, on these multi-PI grants, you know, you have three to six PIs, that's really great, and of course, we have the contact PI as well. Um, I don't know how many investigators you've talked with on the outside, but many investigators view the quote unquote contact PI as the person recognized by the um, NIH as like the main person, which can really impact them in their recognition and review processes at their institutions. So if there's any way to be super clear about it's just an administrative function or working with people to help them understand what it really means when these scientists are going up for recognition and reward. Um, and be creative in the approach to attracting researchers from many different disciplines to the field of exposomics. This might be the um, bring a friend type of thing where one of the granting opportunities or FOA might say, you know, we're looking for a neuro researcher and we're looking for them to partner with somebody who's never been involved before or somebody from a completely different discipline. <clears throat> so I wanted to share just a really brief case study with you. So I've been a faculty member for the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator Program for the last, I'm really sorry, I'm going to pause myself and cough. Sorry. All right, hopefully that worked. So I've been, just to repeat that, I've been a faculty member for the Convergence Accelerator Program for the NSF for the last, I think, about five years. And over the last five years, we've sort of grown and um, evolved this team science component of their um, of their funding award and, and really matured it, had an opportunity to, to mature it. So how the Convergence Accelerator Program works is that there's a phase one award, which is really a planning award. And during that award phase, the teams get, I think, about nine months and they're run through a pretty rigorous curriculum run by the NSF. So I'm a member of the team science faculty. They also have a um, a segment on human-centered design. They also do marketing, communication, and intellectual property. So as part of our the curriculum I've developed with my two collaborators, um, we created this collaboration agreement. And you've already got a bazillion references now to collaboration agreements that you could take a look at. We developed this one for, again, the NSF. They let us genericize it. And you can find it at this link if you're interested in taking a look at it. But it just gives you a sense of some of the things that are, um, are I guess, front and center for us as we, as we see people work together and where the challenges really occur. So you've heard um, a number of great reasons to put in a collab to put together a collaboration agreement, and I'll just mention a couple more. One is when you bring a new member onto the team, it's a fabulous document to share with the new member to say, this is how we work as a team. Read it over, let's, and then let's all sit down and talk about it. You know, they might see things that you don't, new things, and that's worth talking about. How are you going to handle intellectual property? This can be a huge issue. If you think authorship is a big issue, IP issues can be really big too. And so those are really worth talking about up front. If I get one question over and over and over again, it's how do we hold somebody else accountable, especially when you're bringing together PIs, peers from different disciplines. Um, and that's another area that you can cover in the um, collaboration agreement. But the point I really wanted to make with this slide is that all of the teams 
who during phase one took the team science curriculum seriously and put a collaboration in place, a collaboration agreement in place and really worked together as a team have been successful in the phase two award process. And I think that just kind of um, speaks loads to the, the impact that being clear about how you're gonna work together can have in, um, in, a, funding, um, in a funding application. So what do I think the number one skill researchers need to learn is? Um, really how to engage productively across all types of differences. And when I say differences, I mean all of the differences that you've heard each of the investigators talk about up until now. And why is this so important? Because exposomics requires that investigators come together with so many different things different methods, different perspectives, different disciplines, vocabularies, expertise, lived experience, et cetera, in order to do more than any one of them can alone. And I think you've already heard about some of the challenges and just even harmonizing data, for example. So successfully managing difference leads to creativity and innovation. And when it's not well managed, things can become really challenging. And so when I talked a little bit earlier as well about um, productive conflict, for scientists to learn how to engage in conflict in a way that where it's not seen as something negative happens, but it sees it's seen as something positive that happens that can be evil, ev easily overcome. And that's whether you're having those types of issues in the context of the science. I think for scientists, it's easy to engage in productive conflict over the science, at least more so than relationships. But if you can treat those relationship challenges um, in a very similar way, they can be incredibly productive as well. So when I had a pre-meeting with um, David and Karen and Corey and a few other people, um, one of the questions they asked me is, how are the principles of team science distinct for the neural exposome? So here's my answer, nothing and everything all at the same time. And the reason I say that is because I think neural exposomics is a team science. They're one and the same. And I think that's a huge opportunity and it's probably also a huge challenge at the same time. So what does it mean? It means that expectations are different than for independent investigator-led research teams. Collaboration's the norm. It's not the exception. The collaboration agreement is a must in addition to the research plan. Scientists need training in the fundamentals of team science and effective collaborate, collaborative team design. So this is back to my building teams on purpose and providing opportunities for them to have ongoing coaching and consultation can really help them stay on track. Um, I think the three previous speakers made this look so easy, like, oh yeah, anybody can do it. And I really applaud them because not everybody can do that, to, can do this. Um, and especially those people just starting out can really use a lot of assistance and understanding how they can go about doing it. I heard some um, I heard some discussion about how team or project managers or um, team managers um, have been integrated into some of the funding announcements, and I think that that's absolutely essential. I think asking people to form very complex collaborations and not funding them to have a team manager or consultant or people to help them along the way um, would be really problematic. And then I just will build on what Heidi said, um, having a robust approach for recognition and reward is needed. Um, and I think this is a shared responsibility between research institutions and funding agencies so that there's some back and forth. Um, when I was at NIH, I was told by uh, a number of very prominent um, NIH leaders that well, it's, you know, it's really the research institution's problem to figure it out. And I actually think this is a place where collaboration could work really well, because I think research institutions are trying to do their best to recognize and reward their faculty. 
Um, and I think if there's any way for funding agencies to work collaboratively with research institutions to make sure everybody's on the same page, especially as funding agencies are funding more and more team science, I think that'll just be much more powerful. So team science and the team dynamic are inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other. And in order to build teams on purpose, these are the things that you can think about. Agreeing on values and norms, creating shared vision, setting clear expectations. And, and I won't say the rest of them because I think you've heard them all already from everybody else. Um, I will mention the building trust and psychological safety because they are absolutely essential and maybe haven't been spoken to as much. So the last thing I wanted to just mention is that um, Gary Miller, uh, I think he's still on the call. Yep, he's still there, um, reached out to me late last year and told me that he really wanted to bring together a uh, uh, a, a number of scientific experts who were really focused on exposome and bring people together from all the different disciplines that they represent to put in place a definition for exposome and exposomics and so that the research community could be much clearer about what what this is um, what is foundation is and how different disciplines disciplinary areas like um, the neurospace could build upon that and create a definition of their own. And so we worked together last year to design this conference and bring a very, very diverse group of people together to take on this task. Um, it was so, it was viewed as such a challenge that a number of people told us that it wasn't even going to be possible. But we met in early December, and I think we ended up being very successful in being able to walk away from that conference. Um, Pam was there, David was there, um, Sophie was there, and we were, um, I think, really heartened that, you know, it is very possible to bring people with very different backgrounds together to do something really, really important. And so I just didn't want to fail to mention that as I closed up. So. My last note, we can do amazing things when we work together. And I wanna thank you very much for um, the opportunity to, to talk to you. Um, you probably figured out that I enjoy this area uh, a lot and very passionate about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. I'm gonna take the, you know, let's hold questions. Well, I think that, you know, the, the next thing that we have are is, is the discussion. So maybe the questions for uh, Dr. Bennett can just come in as part of that uh, discussion. Uh, and I also see from that the, there was a question in the Q&A asking if the workshop recording will be made available. The answer is yes. I will email all registrants when that is posted. Okay, so now we will move on to the panel discussion. In addition to the speakers that we've had, we have two panelists joining us, Dr. Beata Ritz and Dr. Rosalind Wright. Dr. Beata Ritz is a professor of epidemiology at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health with co-appointments in environmental health sciences and neurology at the UCLA School of Medicine and a member of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. She co-directed the NIEHS-funded Center for Gene Environment in Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease at UCLA that included neuroscientists, human geneticists, and clinicians. She initiated the field of air pollution and pregnancy outcome research in the mid-1990s, and her lab has studied the effects of occupational and environmental toxins focusing on air pollution and pesticides, developing geographic information system-based exposure assessment tools, and more recently, omic tools to discover biomarkers for environmental factors impacting pregnancy and reproductive outcomes and neurodevelopment. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rosalind Wright is the Horace W. Goldsmith Professor of Life Course Health Research in the Department of Pediatrics and Environmental Medicine and Public Health at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, a physician and 
an internationally recognized life course epidemiologist with transdisciplinary training in perinatal environmental programming of chronic disease risk. Dr. Wright is also the, co the founding co-director of the Institute for Climate Change, Environmental Health, and Exposomic Research at the ISMMS. And Dr. Wright has a primary interest in early life predictors of developmental disorders, including asthma and lung development, sleep, and neurobehavioral neuro development. A particular focus of her research has been on the implementation of studies considering the role of the multitude of social, nutritional, and physical environmental factors in explaining health disparities among lower SES ethnically mixed populations. And the panel discussion today will be moderated by Dr. Gina R. Poe, Professor of Integrative Biology and Physiology, Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences, and Neurobiology at UCLA where she is also faculty chair of the Lore Scholars Program. Her laboratory studies the mechanisms by which sleep serves learning and memory consolidation. Dr. Poe directs several programs designed to increase diversity in the STEM fields, including the SFN's NSP, UCLA's MARC program, and the Lore Scholars Program. And as we get started, I'd just like to encourage you to keep entering your questions through the Q&A box. We'll be able to incorporate those into the general discussion. Uh, Gina, I'm happy to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, everyone. This has just been amazing. Um, so the purpose of this panel discussion Q&A is to really sort of thump a lot of the points that were made and also to bring up new um, considerations given the breadth of uh, experiences that our panelists have. So I'm going to open up with the first one um, for both of you, which is really why is team science important in neural exposome research? Um, why can't we do this the old way, like individual cowboys with our, our ones? So you want us to answer? Yeah, please. Yeah. I, I think uh, so. So I, I would say I would have never had so much fun doing research if it hadn't been uh, interdisciplinary and in the end transdisciplinary. Um, and I would like to say that it's not just bench to bedside, which we are all familiar with, but it's really cells to populations. And, you know, I'm at the end of the population spectrum here. And these kind of scientists that I represent, we deal with humans and we deal with populations outside of hospitals. And that's sometimes extremely difficult because you try to do population-based research. And within that environment, you're trying to you try to define the environment for populations and for special groups that may be disadvantaged because of certain types of exposures. And to bring that back to basic scientists and toxicologists who have very different questions to answer in uh, with lab animals and cells, uh, that takes a lot of energy and communication and translation. And I think especially um, kind of going beyond our own value systems. And that is one thing I learned over the last 25 years of talking to many scientists from other areas is we have very different value systems in the way we look at science and scientific validity. And we have to learn to respect each other's fields and to kind of speak each other's language and, and find a way to not uh, disparage each other, which is something that actually has happened many, many years when I was a junior scientist and felt like, you know, population sciences are really not valued um, by basic scientists because we don't have a lab, we don't do experiments, we just observe. So everything is an association and in the end, we don't know anything. And uh, to fight that was really a big struggle. But the big, the big challenge that that encompassed really uh, made it much more interesting what I did. And I was able to probably introduce into population sciences a lot of tools and, and um, techniques as well as insights that without being challenged by my, my uh, collaborators, I never wouldn't step toe, a toe in. And so I, I went from being a straight uh, population science association type and analysis person 
to understanding a lot more about cells and metabolomics and genetics and epigenetics. And I see how much my trainees actually enjoy being able to use all of these tools and to reach out. And, and they are much better at this than I am. So I, I want to really compliment everybody who says we have to bring the trainees in. Rosalind, do you have a, a perspective on this? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think um, I became uh, a team scientist in a transdisciplinary research, much in the way that I think Dr. Jay Lee was talking about in his talk. He trained, he had great training in neuroscience, but he realized he, he, he was limited in being able to ask and answer the types of questions. It, you know, he, he ultimately ran out of runway to say, well, wait, I, I, this isn't getting me further. And then he's, he, along the way you learn, well, maybe I need to know something about immunology. And maybe I need to know something about basic cell biology. And we kind of did that. We felt our way because team science wasn't something that was being talked about uh, when I was kind of coming through. And actually, people would tell me I was unfocused because I would say, I need to talk to this. And, and they would actually see it as a, as a detrimental thing. Now, clinically, I'm I, the one thing that grabbed me in medicine was um, critical care medicine because I wanted to understand the whole. And I'm an adult trained um, critical care intensivist, but my research all goes back to how far back do I need to go to prevent chronic comorbidities and early, um, you know, you know, shorter lives, et cetera. And I go back all the way to the prenatal period. And then you start to want to understand, well, why is it different in different populations? And, you know, I was trained originally in genetics and I realized it's not in the genes. And we talked about that. Dr. Jett talked about that right at the beginning. Can't be happened too fast. Well, now I need to go get some training in environmental health. And then it was like, well, that only explains 10% of it when I'm thinking of traditional environmental factors, air pollutant, tobacco smoke, when I'm looking at lung disease or whatever, or neurodevelopment. What's, what are we missing? Well, it's the social thing. Okay, well, now I need to go back and get trained in stress and health. So I was, I really liked the fact Everybody touched a piece of it because we see how big it is. It's been exemplified in the presentations today. Everybody gave some part of it, big parts of it. But I like that Dr. Bennett got to, we need to go from interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary teams. We need to be training our scientists to do that. And, and I want to make a shout out to the other hat I wear at Mount Sinai is I lead our CTSA, our Clinical Translational Science Award, which is supported through NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. And it is the science of doing translational science and they're big on team science. And that's, we, that they should be in this conversation um, because we do need to train that next generation. And, and that really struck me, particularly with um, Dr. Lee's talk and then Dr. Bennett's talk, who, who I think brought that right back um, to it. I do this because I know, I. I you're a reductionist, you get only so far. That's important part of science. It absolutely is a part of even team science, right? And, and the, the exposomics, we, we do need to drill down at different times. But I, I'm, I do team science. And as I discovered that, wow, if I really open myself up and talk to this person that I never imagined, we'd have anything, you know, maybe scientifically to do together. And you, you like the spinal cord injury where he talked to the, you know, those, the two different people and brought them together to do drug, drug discovery. I thought that was a great example of it. Once you get bit by that, you're like, okay, this is, this is the way to do it. This is the way to tackle these big, hairy problems. And, and nothing's bigger than exposomics. And then you look at the complexity of the neuro, the, you know, neurodevelopment, and then you got to have life course theory in there. You know, you need to know when and, and you know, in the life stage. To me, that's, I want to be a part of that, any part of that. And, and you, you can light up the, you know, junior people coming into this and everything else once you see that you can do something bigger together and support each other, be transparent. Lots of the things that were said just practically, um, you know, set these things up early on right? Come to some consensus of how you're going to run this thing. That's so important. I totally agree because we've all done it the other way. 
and and then you have to expend your energy fixing it and you don't want to you want to keep moving I, that's what i would say that's what i've gotten out i i was looking forward to the talks but it was even better than i anticipated i agree 100% um which you know some of the things that you were saying leads us to my second big question which is you know what are the really biggest challenges for developing team science in this neuro exposome research environment and how can they be addressed? And I think it was addressed in a lot of the different talks, various things, but there are still lots of other challenges, things that you might not expect to run into. For example, you know, great to use Slack, but Slack has changed its funding platform and now it's really expensive. They charge a lot of money for each person. And, and if you try and make one institution responsible for the Slack, then, you know, it's just login issues, all kinds of things that could happen. So in your minds, uh, both of you, Hannah, what are the biggest challenges and and how could they be addressed? And how can we do this together? Yeah, so I have a feeling the biggest challenge is to actually find the team members. And, you know, somebody said, bring a friend. But, you know, that might not be the right person for the project and the question I'm asking. And then I'm asking a question and I know which expert I need, but I can't find that person or that person doesn't want to work with me or, you know, just doesn't like population science and doesn't see a role for them in what we are doing or is expecting something that from us that we cannot deliver. And if you if you just look around the room at your institution or you know your friends at your other institutions that you get to know at maybe some conferences you kind of stay too close within your discipline many times or too close to your discipline mm -hmm. um, to really reach across um, departments and across disciplines is extremely hard and i've seen it work a few times especially when you have a strong leadership who believes in team science and reaches out to members of different um, departments. Um, that's what happened to me at UCLA. And then you get a feeling for how you can integrate over the years. So the, the other real challenge is how does that team then grow together? And you know it's through many, many meetings where you're forced to be there. And you're forced to sit through two hours of some people talking about things where 80% of the time you don't understand what they're saying. And, and I mean it, you know, um, and, and it's a real challenge. And in the end, you find out, well, that 20% is really exciting and I can do something with it. And then there's a, is a will to move forward and you have a goal. And what is this goal and who, you know, keeps moving towards it? Um, so it, it, it's, yeah, it's partially in the leadership, it's partially in the respect of the leadership for each team member, and of finding also a place for each team member to express themselves and to feel valued and to bring the best to the team that they actually have to offer. Is there a way to reduce the 80% of the time you don't understand what someone's talking about? I mean, can you try and... <clears throat> Do a translation thing at the beginning when I say this. I mean that. Um. Yes, it's. I think. Um, I think it gets better when we remind ourselves not to use acronyms and to actually try to to talk in a way that you know you talk to a lay lay educated audience and and that's actually a great skill to develop because it also helps me when I go outside of academia to actually tell politicians or journalists or anybody who wants to listen to me what I have to say about my science. So I think that's another real positive of this team science uh, approach. You actually learn to talk to somebody who is educated enough so you don't have to give all the principles, but you talk in a type of language that translates to what the other person already knows. And, you know, and, and I think that's, that's also a great value. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Rosalind. I think too, I'm um, just to, you know, what you described, um, it, 
or happening organically like you're you continue to reach out and broaden your exposure to these different things within your own institution within across institutions as you know them meetings like this or or where we bring together disparate people to to sort of hear and start to think about how how do we implement this how, you know and and people who've been successful um what are the big questions we're facing and 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 people start to meet the more we can do this, the more the funder, you know, NIH, other organizations, NSF brings us together to do this, have these kinds of conversations. It accelerates that um, beyond what you you yourself can do. That's always was very frustrating to me early on when I wasn't maybe a part of these. So I think somebody has said it a couple of times here, bring the junior people into these conversations as early as possible. Because that it is frustrating until you've established yourself a little bit, you don't get in the room. So the sooner we get in the room together, the faster this can go. Um, the other thing I would say, and it's come up here a couple of times as well, I think it's absolutely essential that we have to bake this into the ecosystem of every academic um, research institute, institution, medical center, whatever, that team science is where we're going for some of these issues. And that people get credit for team science. And it's not if you're just first or last author or com you know, communicating multi-PI or not. Um, and we've come a long way from what used to be. That was said to me ver you know, just outright. If you're not first or last, don't give a minute to, you know, things like this I heard along the way. I mean, crazy. Because and then you start seeing the, the value of team science. Well, that has to change, right? Um, culturally at across this and, and I think we're we're moving in that direction and what will do it is when NIH and other funding organizations do these kinds of things you're going you're funded as this you highlight it multi pis adds value the this has been these are um, critical things when we in our promotions committees where I am at my institution it's the it's the first institution I've been at where it's just really written right in there, team science. You can annotate your bibliography. Maybe your your co-author, you know, co-first, co-last, but also annotate. Why are you important? Someone brought up, should we be, does does someone who builds the data infrastructure warrant warrant um, authorship? There was a time where you didn't think that, that, you know, that's their job. Boy, I feel very, I couldn't do this work and pull all this data together and wrangle this data and harmonize this data, et cetera. Those people are, are co-authors and they're critical to having it. And you know, you do it in different ways. You have mastheads or what have you, you but you, you write those things out and people have said that, right? This is our rules of engagement. And that takes extra time, but it's so valuable in the long run. Yeah, you guys have both mentioned something that's really near and dear to my heart, which is you know, letting junior people in the room and um, and the problems and um, the good parts about the bring a friend kind of way of diversifying, and that is diversifying the voices that are involved in solving these really difficult, really complex problems. Um, and so, letting junior people into the room helps that. Um, and then, bring a friend is is great in in terms of an easy way to to broaden the team um, with trusting people. However, that also can buy into the whole good old boys network and having the same people doing the same things all the time. So what might be another way to, to increase diversity in the team, which we all know is healthy? So, so what I really found the most helpful when I was part of all these centers were actually the annual meetings where all the different um, fundees were getting together and uh, I see two of them at least on this call mm -hmm. and what was so fantastic was it was the um, uh, senior people who helped organize it and structure it but it was really a platform for the junior people to show their research and to socialize and to be able to talk to the senior members of other teams in a really comfortable and um, yeah, reassuring context. And we were able to build 
collaborations and um, communications that I thought were extremely uh, valuable and unique and really lasted over decades in the end. So yes, I think these um, these environments that you know foster this, Gordon conferences have that a lot, for example, or um, some some other um, uh, private institutions have these workshops over a week where you know where they bring together seniors and juniors to talk to each other about a theme. I think they're extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Training. Yeah. Our... yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, I I also Roz, you, you, Rosalind, you said something that was really also very interesting and important, which is the cultural change that needs to happen within institutions to value team science. And um, we, as we all know, culture can change quite slowly, but it could also change quickly given given the right impetus. So, um, and all of these things that you guys are mentioning sort of brings me to the idea that. There needs to be a high profile, short, a pithy article on best practices in team science um, and, and what's going to move the needle so that we can do this better. Is So if we were to write such an article, if someone were to write such an article, um, what kinds of things would we put in there? What are the best practices, do you think? For I mean, we've already mentioned a few of them. Maybe we can recapitulate them and I mean, say them again. I think we also need to reach out to professional societies to actually pitch this concept, because I now, as a more senior scientist, am asked to write letters and evaluate people six times a day. <laughs> I don't know, you know, and and I have my criteria, and I usually look for this team science aspect. And I make a big deal that it's not just first and last authorship when we are looking at leaders or at team members um, that we need to actually, you know, I, I, I try to figure out what it is that this person contributes that is a team science aspect. And I think that's something we can all learn how to do and we can promote. Uh, across our yeah, professional societies and encourage people to be um, positive and not negative um, in, in terms of transdisciplinary um, uh, sites of, of researchers, you know, not, I've, I've been, when I was a, a student in medical school, I asked my advisor what I'm good at, and he said, Beate, you're good at nothing, but good at a lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> You're a generalist, just go with that, you know? So, so, and when I came to the US, I was told, well, you have to really become the expert in this one thing, and then you're going to be making it. And, you know, I was never that one expert. And so I keep telling my students, you know, we might become that one expert, but we might also just be a good team member. And, you know, that should be as valuable. Right. It, be, it depends on what question you're trying to ask and answer, <laughs> whether you have to be. And that was that was the you know, that was told to all of us. You have to be known for one thing. What is it? And that was when I was told I was unfocused because I, I didn't <laughs> think I needed to be known for one thing. And I was comfortable there. OK, fine. If, if it doesn't work out, but at least I'm searching for the answers I'm looking for. And you have to kind of believe in that and have that do that, have that internal barometer. <laughs> Of what, where you're going and what you're trying to do. I think for a best practices paper in this context, I mean, we've said it here, it, it, it was exemplified in, in several of the talks. This is just a team science problem. Neuroscience, exposomics, you put those together. It, it, it can't be done any other way. What maybe lessons learned from the combine program be a part of, maybe leverage that. Um, because we heard some talks that, that really showed that, and, you know, lessons learned. Some of it's going to be, you know, more universal team science, um, best practices, that kind of thing. But how do you apply it here to move things forward and have people start to see the successes? I think it, on the face of it, 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 ju it just is obvious this is a team science and we need to help. We need to start to solve it. You don't have to do it all to make big steps forward. Exposomics, I always say, you don't have to measure it all. We, the ideal 
you know, from cradle to grave, everything you've been exposed to over the course of your life, plus the internal response to those things, you, you, you're done right there because you think, well, that's impossible. But then you, if you unpack it some, you, you really make huge advances by doing just pieces of it in, in as team, in a team science approach in a bigger, bigger way. And, and we, it pushes us to develop the tools, the technologies, the computational science, et cetera, right? Just like genomics, as we, you know, started to say, hey, we need to sequence the, the whole genome. We have to do deep sequencing. People started investing. We got the tools, the technology, the, you know, our statisticians help develop methods that we could actually look at all this data. Now we have AI and, and, and we're at this inflection point where that's, you know, that's what we need to be able to look and, at, um, you know, 400 and hundreds and thousands even of different things at one time, right? Can't do it with the human brain, but we need our, our data scientists. We need to invest in the um, computer power that's going to house this data. We had an example we heard of, well, this is how we solved it in our um, situation. But, but, you know, we need to think about that. How much do we need to invest? We, if, if we're really going to move forward in this way, there's going to have to be a huge investment in that type of interest. And this may be coming in the April workshop, you know, but, but you do need to start thinking that way. But I think the best practice is why not build from this combine program, you know, and, and just say it out right. It's got to be team science. Here's how we started. Here's what we've learned. Where do we go from here? That kind of thing. I don't know. That, that would be interesting to me. That would be fantastic. So I want to do two things at this moment, which is um, invite the audience members to make sure and they put their questions in the Q&A because this is the time for us to discuss your questions um, aloud and, and open. And also to invite um, the other panelists and speakers that are on this call right now to chime in. Um, I would love to hear from some people. Uh, David, you've got a question or comment. Yes, please take it away. I feel bad as the first one. But <laughs> I want to start with the hardest thing. This has been so great. I feel so much better. I mean, you know, I really think that we're going somewhere now. So I want to start with the hardest thing that I can think about. And that is, um, these are all great ideas. I'm thinking something like, so if you're going to study um, Lewy body disease and you're going to have different people, well, I, I do it this way and I do it this way. I use this, I use that. And you bring them all together. That, that's good. You know, you bring it up. But we're talking about somebody who does social stuff. Other ones do, do chemi chemicals. Other ones do sleep. Other ones do climate. That's the part that scares me. To bringing those get, bringing them together, making them work together, and making the directors of the of the part that they work from say that this is good to do, <laughs> and, and and it's going to help you. That's the thing that I and it's, it's just that. And then the other thing I already said about you know getting. Um, well, well, let's just do one at a time. I'll just stop there because that's that's the hardest part. And I don't I don't know how much more time we have. Stop there. Yeah. So you're saying, David, that the hardest thing is getting all these people to talk to each other and getting the community to value each member um, individually. So does anyone have a a perspective on this? Heidi? Uh, or, yeah, go ahead. I raise my hand. <laughs> um, so I'm like Dave, I just jump right in. But uh, I think, you know, the the obvious and most difficult answer to that and most challenging answer is money. You know, researchers are going to follow the money, David. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> so if you make it implicit in the funding opportunities that it has to be a, a what was the word that Michelle used, cross-disciplinary effort, um, in order to be competitive for funding, that will force these people to talk to each other. Um, I also think that it will be important for the field to move forward that we find leaders who are really good at this. Um, we have some examples here on this panel who can lead by example. And then third, I think institutions themselves, a lot of them, 
have opened up um, are embracing the concept that team science is going to be essential to solving grand challenges. We call them wicked problems at UC Davis. But you know, there's a lot of uh, money within the state of California being put forth by UCOP. There's a lot of foundations that are putting money into bringing together these cross-disciplinary teams to really tackle these very, very challenging questions that are threatening society. I mean, I think we're sort of on uh, the cusp of understanding that our society is at risk as we know it, and that we need to really begin to work together to address some of these. So I think we need to leverage that um, swelling recognition of, you know, no one person's going to solve this on their own. And I know at least a lot of the people I talk to at the meetings I go to, and I may be preaching to the choir or talking to the choir, I'm not sure, but, you know, they, they all feel a personal commitment to wanting to do this. It's not just a scientific commitment, but it's a personal commitment to improving the world for our kids, for ensuring there is a world for our kids. Um, and so I think we really need to uh, kind of leverage that and, and, you know, say and make it clear that that the kind of science that NINDS wants to fund is going to help us reach that that goal or achieve that goal. Karen, that's wonderful. Absolutely, Karen. Right. I heard Pam mention money, so I'm going to chime in about funding opportunities. So um, we I think we had this uh, issue or Kind of recognizing, for example, with the brain initiative, um, we were we had in mind specific scientific disciplines that we wanted to bring together. And so I think in our perspective, there are two ways to go about this. One is you hope that the science proposed will bring in all these um, disciplines that you wanted to see there, or you could just encourage or be prescriptive in your funding um, opportunity that this is we want, uh, we encourage discipline X to collaborate with discipline Y. And that's what we did for the brain initiative where um, we wanted to bring the theorists and the experimentalists together. And so that's one of the things we encourage explicitly in our um, funding opportunities uh, so that, uh, and then we provide resources to promote that kind of. Yeah, but getting someone to review these things is also a huge challenge. Um, because if, if, if a grant application is wonderfully transdisciplinary, but you can't get a reviewer that can see that or see the value of it, then it's not even discussed and program officers can't even pluck it out of the pile. Uh, so that seems to be a huge challenge. Right, if I can chime in on that too. And that's where the value of having a special emphasis panel, and that works so well for the brain initiative and also for the combined program. There is the challenge of um, making sure you have the appropriate expertise. And so um, Corey was one of the SROs um, who worked with our team of SROs. And it, it, it pretty much led to at least four, I think, I think four reviewers, at least four reviewers per application um, to represent, to make sure that we have the expertise representation. Thank you. Fiate. Yeah, I, I want to actually be hopeful and tell David that, yes, it seems like uh, quite an effort to bring all these people to the table and to make it work. The good news is that on the environmental side, we have been trying to do this for the last decades already. So toxicologists and exposure scientists have actually talked to population scientists and, and MDs, and there's a lot of collaboration already ongoing. I think it's less in the neuroscience um, community or better between the environmental scientists and the neuroscientists except for the few that actually in our community specialize on the brain. But I think that that gap can be bridged by requiring neuroscientists to actually work with people like us or better the people we trained. And um, they will learn from each other very quickly and it will become extremely exciting. Uh, if I hadn't had the experience of these center grants, I wouldn't now be in funded by DOD in a project with IPSCs, where we put the pesticides we are identifying in the fields um, that might be uh, related to Parkinson's and IPSCs and do some really exciting experiments in the lab. Of course, that's not me, that's the collaborators who had the insight to ask me. And I think this, this is possible. 
Thank you. That's absolutely right. Heidi, how do you? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to jump on some of the things that have been said about the importance of funding. Um, you know, our group relies almost entirely on uh, volunteer efforts because we it's been difficult for our group to get funding. And part of that is because our projects develop like as they go. So we're not really well suited for traditional funding mechanisms where you have a really well well uh, defined problem uh, from and team uh, composition from the start. And funding is crucial also to the diversification effort. You know, by relying on volunteer efforts, we're really limiting participation to people who have the luxury of time and uh, other funding. So I just, um, and then also I want to really um, jump on what Beate said earlier about using her voice in like her status as a reviewer recommender to amplify the importance of contributions to team science. We're constantly trying to raise awareness of that. So I just want to put a put a plea out there for everybody who's sitting on, you know, review panels for funding applications or um, reviewing tenure applications, things like that, to use your clout um, as senior scientists to sort of change the incentive model to um, help change the perception of these contributions, because that's a really important um, factor in all of this. Yeah, Heidi, I just wanted to follow up on one thing that you just said, which was that a lot of these collaborations are organic, they develop quickly, they happen quickly and their funding mechanisms are things that you know happen slowly you know from the idea to getting the grant could be a minimum nine months and so maybe do we need to change the way that we process these ideas and and pitch them and get them through council and all of that um so that it speeds up the process because yeah, you're right. It really does limit diversity if you're relying on people who are already well funded and already plugged in. So, yeah. Yeah. So one thing that we've we've pursued some opportunities, but from our perspective, there just aren't enough out there is what we really need from our perspective is funding for the infrastructure and for the central support that's not tied to a specific uh, empirical project because that's really what helps move these projects forward is to not have to have projects like redevelop that infrastructure and those support teams on a project by project basis, but to have that central infrastructure that can support multiple projects and learn from projects to apply to the next project. So my position is funded sort of by institutional money and we're piecing things together, but it's a very unique situation that my position even exists. Um, and so, yeah, like having having funding out there to support infrastructure um, is crucial, I think, um, to help help these things be sustainable and build upon uh, projects as they go forward. Great idea. Thank you. Uh, Rosalind. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Um recognize there's some comments in the chat I know from Gary Miller and then Michelle Bennett that there are there are examples of being promoted and, and institutions certainly recognizing teen science they are what my point was they're not systemically there I'm part of the CTSA there are 60 some CTSAs across academic medical centers I can tell you we spend a lot of time talking about how do we do this more systemically how do we bake this in because we do think it's critical and we're talking about some ways to do it through your societies, through our, our positions when we're doing tenure letters, et cetera. But we have to be, I think, a little bit more um, purposeful in, in thinking about how to make that happen more fit, more quickly. That's what, what I'm saying. I also want to put a plug in for the ECHO program. And, and David um, had mentioned in his talk that there, you're already you know, connected with the ECHO program, which is the influence the environmental influences on child health outcomes. So we're starting early in pregnancy, childhood, following up, neurodevelopment is in neurobehavior is one of the four key areas, the five key areas, if you call, count positive health, which is key. Um, we, you know, seven years ago, we came together 
existing cohorts and then coming together and creating a harmonized protocol to go forward with. And we were, we're, we're still are, we're very diverse. We're now in the second seven year period. And, and, and in the beginning, there were people who just, I didn't want to get out of my comfort zone. I like the psychosocial, I'm going to stick to that. And, and, when we, and we, we kind of forced it in all of our face-to-face -face meetings, our ongoing steering committee meetings, the, the talks that we had, um, cross-fertilization of environmental scientists with social scientists looking at the same outcome area, that kind of thing. And gradually people started to feel a little bit more comfortable in understanding you know, we really do need to think about these two things together. You cannot think of one in, in isolation of the other, geospatial, whatever. Uh, and again, I would say we don't have to do it all to make big progress. So, so that's one way, David, you don't have to put everybody in the room together for a, every given thing. But, but, but you know, that diversity of, of viewpoints and frameworks is so incredible to do so. Um, so I usually manage it that way. I don't have to do everything. I don't have to, you know, but we're still going to make big progress. Thank you. Yes. Jay. You know, with the authorship and I guess um, contribution issue, uh, you know, we, we also have a CTSA here and, and it's, it's, uh, it's discussed heavily and it's really a catalyst for team science training. And so we certainly appreciate that at the University of Miami. Um, you know, we, we have a, faculty here that is uh, it can be defined classically as a team science player contribute significantly and then when it comes to promotion and tenure um, you know it, it it's it's uh, overlooked and so fortunately we have a department chair that recognizes that and really pushes for it so I think there are um, mechanisms still in place for example if your chair is supportive and is willing to you know uh, argue that in front of the P, uh, a promotion and tenure committee, you know, those kind of things help. But yeah, there are, there are very few uh, systematic uh, processing place. And then um, I, I think the, um, so, uh, I think uh, somebody brought up the uh, contact PI uh, issue at the NIH level. And, and so, you know, this is something that I had faced when we got the RM1 grant is that you know, universe, so I am listed as the contact PI. And, and so when you look us up, look up the team at the NIH reporter, right, it, I will come up as contact and all the, so all the MPIs will come up and they're certainly be searchable. But when it comes to things like Blue Ridge rankings, where they, um, you know, I, I, I rank the departments according to NIH uh, funding, right, my other uh, co-institutes, Rutgers and um, Georgetown, are not listed as the recipients of that, right? And and so from their chair's perspective, that puts their the NPIs at a significant disadvantage. So I think those are you know some things that maybe the NIH could uh, possibly work on. Yeah, it seems very solvable, and also the authorship order is you know the first and last author. That's a very neuroscience discipline problem. There are other disciplines that have 100 authors on a paper and they just list them alphabetically. Um, and uh, so maybe there's a way in this electronic age that authorship doesn't have to be linear, but rather could be a cloud of authors that you could just click on any one person and get what their contributions were instead of there being a first and last authorship. You know, Pam, what, what were you thinking? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to ask a question, actually, of the NINDS staff, which will be very helpful for the working group to know your perspective on this, which is, um, you know, I think one thing that all the subcommittees within the working group have been discussing is uh, cross, um, or I should, trans institute, trans funding agency initiatives, because of the fact that interdis interdisciplinary science and neural exposome science research is going to be very expensive. And we understand there are limited um, funds that are available within any given institute. And that some of the expertise required for exposomic research resides already in other agencies, other, other institutes, thinking primarily, for example, of NSF. Um, you know, what, what is the reality? I mean, is, if we propose this as a solution, is that something that's even feasible? Um, are you know are there examples of that happening? I know with across institutes it happens, 
but it would be helpful to the committee to understand from you all, you know, what are the resources available and what are your limitations on really promoting this type of big team science? Well, I mean, I, I just type, well, you could tell we've been working together for 30 years or whatever, because I just put that in the chat and I did, I decided not to put it in there. I think that there's one good thing about this whole exosome thing. Um, how should I put this? I'll, I'll just say this. It's actually bringing the ICs together. Remember, I just talked to you about the thing where in social and chemical and sleep and climate. It's not going to work without collaboration among the ICs. No chance. No chance. And so um, I have been here forever, but I have never collaborated with more ICs in the last two years than ever out of my two 20 some years here. So it's 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 coming along. It's coming along. We have to understand that this is not about, you know, who has what and who doesn't have what and all those things and, and competition and everything. It's about it's not going to happen if we don't do this. And everybody's starting to get to that. So I'm 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 actually pretty optimistic on this. And I have been I can list the, you know, certainly in IEHS, I mean, we have, for instance, we have a um environmental an NIH environmental uh, group. And the co-chairs are me and one from uh, NIEHS. And so things like that are happening now. And I'm optimistic that it's going to be even better as we realize we have to do this if we're going to do exosome. And everybody's on board with exosome. At first, it was like, what is an exosome? Now everybody knows what it is. And they're, they're, they're getting um, really excited about it. So I, but you you got, you know, you, you, you took the, out of my uh, head, of course. <clears throat> Neil. Thanks. Uh, just while we're in between uh, some of these questions, I just have a logistical thing, which is I know um, we're at the end of our scheduled time. And I understand there may be some people that need to drop off. That's totally fine. I think we're going to keep this going for about another 15 minutes. If you uh, have to go, that's fine. And, um, you know, once again, we're recording the uh, this workshop, and I'm, I'm going to share it with everyone that uh, has been here, the panelists, the attendees, uh, everyone. So thank you all. Thank you, Neil. Yeah. Has anyone not been able to um, contribute to this? They have things to say. Uh, how about Amy, how are you, what are you thinking? What's important in your mind? Oh, sure. Thank you so much for, for uh, asking. I've been listening and just really enjoying these presentations over the course of today. This has been a wonderful, wonderful session. One of the things that I'm reflecting on in thinking of team science is, of course, thinking beyond the academic bubble and thinking uh, into the community, into um, different decision makers at, at all levels that potentially could hold both resources and access towards intervention, towards mitigation of some of the adverse exposures within the exposome. And I would be so interested to hear our uh, panelists and the group consider that and consider um, thinking about uh, partnerships beyond the traditional academic and research ones. So perhaps weighing in on that and weighing in on um, the different infrastructure and processes that would be required to facilitate that mo most successfully. It's a great question. Thanks. Who wants to tackle that one? Has anyone reached outside of our traditional um, academic scientific enterprise to collaborate on a neuroexposome or other project? How do you, for example, gather in community? Yeah, Biere. Yeah, I think for environmental scientists, it's a natural, you know, we cannot study uh, environmental causes if we don't go out in the community and we talk to people in the community and to leaders and we engage with different um, stakeholder groups, either patient groups or, you know, community activists, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the, the best model for this has been NIEHS that actually has been funding within the center grants 
uh, a lot of these community outreach projects and, and actually made them mandatory. And because of that, a lot has happened on the community side and there, there is a lot of collaboration going on. When we talk about lab science, um, that might be a lot harder um, because you know it's uh, it's a it's a disciplinary issue. However, when it comes to sampling and when it comes to maybe engaging with uh, partners in the community that do that reach out, uh, that that disseminate information that, you know, reach out to schools, reach out to certain groups and make the information that we generate in the lab then available to the community so that they can participate uh, in, in that way. And there's an actual dialogue <laughs> about it. Uh, I think that that makes a big difference. Yeah, I think your point about dialogue is important because we have things we can learn. We're not we tend to think of ourselves at the peak of the ivory tower, but in fact, you know, we're all community members too, and um, we learn from each other. So we need to listen um, just as much as we speak. I, I love that. Yeah, Rosalind. Yeah, I would agree with everything that Beata said. NIHS is a great example of that. Environmental um, health researchers have been doing this in a major way for some, quite some time. And you have to, I mean, I can't, every time I've reached out to community in different ways, what my prior was of what might be the priorities and the things that they're concerned about often turn out to not be the case. And things that I might, you might think, oh, I'm going into community with lower uh, resources, et cetera, on the macro level. And you go in and you just find amazing things about resiliency factors. And I, I would always, I would also say to folks, we're not just, when we're looking at the exposome, we're not just looking at the risk factors, we're also looking for the resiliency factor. There's a balance all across the life course, right? And some of those might be nutrition, some of those might be social connectedness, what have you. And, and again, those are, are very broad. It's, it, and, and I think climate science and climate change, and when you're coming from an academic medical center, academic medical centers are actually drilled in on climate change and how it's going to affect healthcare delivery and uh, needs. And it's the that's a lever we could pull <laughs> because we know climate is going to affect all these aspects of the exposome that we're talking about, from the social eco anxiety to you know to air pollution differences, changes in, in you know, wildfire smokes. I mean, Mount, uh, New York City was the most polluted, you know, city on the planet on June 8th this year. I was sitting in my office, all of a sudden dark at 2 p.m. We're seeing things, we're all experiencing it. People are keyed in. I think it's a good thing to think about leveraging um, for more funding, for getting the ICs together. Around, and whether you're focusing in on neurosciences or other things, I think that that's that's important. And it's important to know that all the academic medical centers know it's going to cost them, and they're laser focused. And so we're, you know, you, you got to kind of pick up on those trends, I think, and take advantage for things you're trying to do. And and I, and I, we're doing that in our communities. We're we're spending a lot of time in our communities now, teaching them how to use GIS mapping to to just on a level where they can actually start to see, oh my goodness, yeah, this is what happens. And, and crowdsourcing, someone else brought that up in, in one of their talks with, um, you know, I forget how many countries across, you know, it, it, that was amazing to me. That was so, Heidi, I think. Tools like that. Yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of exciting things going on in that area. Yeah, I totally agree. Amy. Yes, so uh, I just love these responses uh, that have been offered by Rosalind and Vita, and I I must uh, I'd just like to expand on it a bit. I was just actually at a community action panel last evening about lead and lead poisoning and children's lead concerns within an, uh, a deeply disadvantaged inner city uh, neighborhood context, and. Um, 
I've been involved with a number of these community initiatives. And one of the things that I think is incredibly important is to recognize the power of the community itself as an intervention towards the exposome and also the um, incredible motivation that I, at least I have personally seen in my own experience that communities at the local level, uh, at county level, city level will take this information and, tr and move it to actionability quite quickly in a way that doesn't necessarily necessarily rely directly on NIH resources uh, or NSF resources, the traditional research resources, but could potentially form the kernel of a really wonderful natural experiment in thinking about resilience and change and intervention uh, from a policy or community action level. So um, just to put a plug in for that, for the importance of science that um, truly integrate some of these community levers in a way that potentially could uh, rigorously assess the outcomes from an exposomal level and follow those forward. Uh, I think there's some great examples that are going on now, but of course the science would have to be nimble and quite pragmatic. So uh, exciting times though. Absolutely, can you give us just one example? Can you think of one? That well, certainly um, uh, with the work that we do, we partner with communities all the time. Um, let me just bring up the panel that I was involved in last evening. Um, we were trying to bring together different uh, groups around childhood lead poisoning in inner city Milwaukee. And uh, it has brought together the waterworks department about how things should be targeting and what types of algorithmic approaches and data should be used to prioritize where those backhoes are sent and where the resources are sent family members to understand that they need to advocate uh, for themselves and their children with at all levels. Uh, different lawyers were there talking about how different types of policy changes need to go forward and then city officials were there as well. And when I think about that kind of um, impetus that is going forward, the potential to follow that, to document and to study how effective or ineffective it is towards some of these locally targeted initiatives. At least in the city of Milwaukee, their approach, instead of being reactive to lead level um, detection in children is to try to take a proactive approach right now, but to target it on certain most disadvantaged zip codes, just, you know, a very small area, but it accounts for probably 70% of the lead poisonings in that particular city. So it's a really kind of innovative approach from a policy level. Um, and I'm seeing this in other, other cities across the country. We've all heard of Flint, of course, but these issues of this this intersectionality of our inner city crumbling infrastructure with adverse exposomal exposures is profound. And of course, we could come up with examples in Native American communities, rural communities, and others as well. But I do think that the power of the community to bring resources to the table um, is really profound. And uh, it's been my experience to get very, very excited around many of these issues because it touches them so deeply and in, in the health of their children and themselves over their life course. So, so yeah, I, I do think that it's a, it would be a wonderful area of study, um, but again, would require um, multidisciplinarity. We'd have to think about nimbleness. We'd have to think about, um, you know, pragmatic issues that sometimes make research a little bit messy, but a whole lot of, of uh, excitement and fun, of course. I love it. Neil, are we getting to be about the time where we need to wrap up? <laughs> yeah, I was just checking the clock. So we're uh, now at time. I'd like to uh, Thank everyone for their participation and for coming uh, to this workshop. Uh, it was I mean, fascinating and uh, I learned a lot. I hope that all of you did too. Thank you, know, thank, thank you to everyone. Yeah. Um, thank you for working. It's oh. amazing, right? Yes. Thank you guys. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, I can't tell you how helpful this is going to be for our uh, office. And um, please come back. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, for the real yeah. uh, help with this. <laughs> I have about Thanks, five so. more questions, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks all. Yeah. Terrific.